are champions. And then there are champions of champions. But a very rare few can claim the crowns of multiple weight divisions at the same time. There it is! The reigning lightweight title holder, Gervonta Davis, has won titles in two weight divisions. Current super featherweight king, Leo Santa Cruz, has earned championships in four weight classes. It's the elite versus the elite in a pound-for-pound -pound slugfest of champions. A product of the streets and gyms of Baltimore, Maryland, Gervonta Davis has demolished all his opponents in spectacular style. And this fight is over! He's eager to prove that he is more than a Nova, shining brightly, then fading. A win against Santa Cruz would elevate Davis to superstar status. The fighting Mexican heritage of the Santa Cruz family produced a champion who has avenged his only defeat. Santa Cruz scoring with his blows! And bested his fellow Angelino rival. While both these titleists are highly decorated champions, each has sought a signature win. Now they have that career-defining opportunity. Gervonta Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz. The winner garners titles in two weight divisions and stakes a claim at greatness. in the heart of Texas for this Showtime pay-per-view presented by Premier Boxing Champions. Showtime Sports has had a storied history here at the Alamo Dome, and tonight we write a new significant chapter. Hello, everyone. Happy Halloween. I'm Brian Custer. Welcome to the first major boxing event with fans in attendance since March when the COVID-19 pandemic shut down most live events. Tonight, Two world champions headline a pay-per-view main event for the first time in their careers. The undefeated Gervonta Davis is a three-time world champion and the current WBA lightweight title holder. He's a powerful, explosive knockout artist called Tank, and he boasts a nearly perfect KO record, 22 and 23 victories. The once beaten Leo Santa Cruz has avenged his only loss. He's a four division champion, and the current WBA super featherweight belt holder. Now, Leo's known for his Mexican style, come forward and deliver a high volume punch output that really overwhelms his opponents. Well, the winner of this fight will walk out of the ring with a well-earned lofty spot on that pound for pound list. Now, as we mentioned, fans are here in attendance at the Alamo Dome with up to 10,000 people expected Tickets were sold in small groups of two, four, six, and as you can see, the crowd is spaced out to ensure proper social distancing. Now, in order to safely present this live boxing event, we are following strict protocols to ensure the safety of the boxers and the support staff on hand. There were temperature checks for all fans entering the Alamo Dome. The fighters were tested prior to traveling to Texas, and everyone involved in this event was tested upon arrival. Athlete Advantage Medical has been administering the tests and delivering the results within 24 hours. The fighters have been quarantined at their hotel in a protective bubble and were tested again before fighting. Now, a technical buffer zone with limited access has been established around the ring, which is sanitized before and after each fight. 
Face masks are mandatory with limited exceptions, and we are all respecting the guidelines for social distancing. Well, joining me tonight at a distance from ringside, the team, they're going to be calling all the action. Of course, Mauro Ranallo, he's the voice of Showtime Boxing. Al Bernstein, he's our Hall of Famer and four-time world champion, Abner Mares. And Mo, all right, let's dive into this main event because it's rare that when you have a fight where the winner walks away with titles from two different weight divisions, and I think it's the main reason Davis and Santa Cruz believe the winner should be on that mythical pound-for-pound -pound list. Yeah, Brian, despite the alphabet groups handing out belts like Halloween candy, a matchup of this nature is happening for just the third time in the last 87 years. No doubt this compelling confrontation is a gateway to elite status. Much credit is due on both sides. After just one fight at 130, Santa Cruz, whose offensive output makes the battery bunny sweat, called out Davis in order to try to secure a signature victory and a title in a fifth division. Davis, who hits harder than a disc track, accepted the challenge of facing the most accomplished opponent of his career while moving back down in weight to do so. BC, it's a thriller, thriller night, and no one's going to save you from the beast about to strike. Cue Vincent Price's evil laugh. Fellas. <laughs> The program has just started, and Mo wants to be starting something. All right, Mo. <laughs> Al, listen, you have watched both of these guys develop into champions, and I think it's appropriate that they meet, considering both have been criticized in the past for the level of opponents. Yeah, that's true. You know, when Santa Cruz uh, pushed for this fight at his father's behest, it really served the needs of both he and Gervonta Davis. You know, his feeling was uh, that calling out the bigger, stronger Davis would put to rest those thoughts that his competition hadn't been at its best. He had his, uh, of course, his rivalry fights with Frampton and with Abner Maritz, but in between, some people questioned his defenses. Now, for Gervonta Davis, as he navigated the waters of boxing politics, trying to get a big matchup. He too was criticized in some cases for the opposition he faced. And so this was kind of like a manna from heaven for him because certainly Santa Cruz is the best fighter that he has faced in his career. You know, I think they took that attitude into the promotion of this fight. They didn't create some silly made up feud. Instead, they accentuated what a challenge the other fighter was. And I think that's made this fight even more appealing. Yeah, you're right about that. I mean, they both have had nothing but the utmost respect for uh, one another, and both of them are trying to dare to be great tonight. Uh, Abner, you know, I think you bring a unique perspective on how this fight may play out in the ring, considering you fought Leo twice, and you were just days away from fighting Tank. Definitely days away from fighting Tank Davis. Unfortunately, I suffered a detached retina and eye injury, and I had to pull out of that fight. But hey, I was days away, like you mentioned, and I studied him really well, and I did my homework. And what I wanted to exploit a year ago was the undisciplined and, and the lack of discipline and experience that, that, that Tank Davis didn't have then. But it's been three a year ago and three fights since. And I think the experience is there. He's been looking better and better. And the discipline, I think he had, he had to learn the hard way, especially against Gamboa, where it seemed like he wasn't 100%. And he Gamboa took up to deep waters and had a rough night there. So and plus, Tank Davis made weight coming into his fight. So it talks about his discipline and, and the, how he's growing as a fighter. Now, Leo Santa Cruz, uh, Leo has to be disciplined too. I fought, fought him 24 rounds. He's a great fighter. Um, he doesn't get credit for being a great fighter, uh, a boxer. He's a volume puncher, but he's a good fighter too from the distance. And you saw it against me. When he kept me at a distance with the jab, I, I just couldn't get in. He's got a great distance. He's got to use it all night and he's got to stay disciplined. Work the jab, get Tank Davis tire, make him miss, make him throw the power punches, and then the, as a pro that you are, take him into deep waters. He'll know when to go in and be the volume puncher that he always is. Yeah, it sounds like kind of like his game plan, what he told us uh, this week. All right, guys, I appreciate it. We'll get back to all of you guys in just a moment. You know, it's a huge night here on Showtime Pay Per View. So let's set the full lineup ahead. The main event three time world champion Gervonta Davis takes on four division world champion. Leo Santa Cruz with both fighters current titles at stake. 
Then the co-main event. It is an all-Texas matchup as the unbeaten San Antonio, San Antonio native and WBA super lightweight champion Mario L. Azteca Barrios defends his title against Cowboy Ryan Carl. And New Orleans native, but now Texas resident, Regis Rugaru Prodre. He returns to the ring for the first time since last October when he lost to Josh, Ty uh, Josh Taylor, which is really the only defeat on his record. And Prodre takes on the unbeaten contender Juan Heraldez in a super lightweight fight. And we're going to open the night with an IBF lightweight title eliminator as Isak Cruz and Diego Magdaleno square off in a 12 round clash. You know, the winner in line for a title shot against the IBF champion Teofimo Lopez. And as our first fight approaches, we got to remind you Showtime delivers original content across multiple media platforms. You know, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. On Twitter, make sure you take part in our polls. Give us your pick of the winner of each fight. And on Facebook, viewers and fight fans can interact in real time. Now, before we get to the fights, DraftKings and Showtime Sports have collaborated to create a custom pick'em game. Now, it's exclusive to Showtime Boxing, and you can get in on the action by going to DraftKings.com slash Showtime. Our fight coverage from San Antonio begins in just a moment. Davis versus Santa Cruz is being brought to you by Showtime Pay-Per-View, by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. And by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. Well, the wait is over. It is time for our opening bout of the evening. Isaac Cruz, Diego Magdaleno. Let's go down ringside. Here's Mo. Thanks a lot, BC. It is fight night on Fright Night. Let's do the time warp again. Fans are back and in masks on this most unique Halloween night. 12-year pro Diego Magdaleno turned 34 earlier this week, coming off a career-saving victory over Austin Dulé in February. Meanwhile, the 22-year-old Cruz has gone 14-0-1 with 11 knockouts since his only pro loss in his sixth pro fight. In February of this year, he looked good, defeating Thomas Matisse by decision on Showbox. Well, Magdaleno started boxing when he was eight, had 130 amateur fights, including wins against Mikey Garcia and Saddam Ali. And, well, he has come up short in his most high-profile fights to date, dropping title belts to Terry Flanagan and Roman Martinez, in addition to a 2019 TKO loss against current lightweight champion Teofimo Lopez. But Magdaleno saved his career in his last fight, and he is here, ready to show he has a lot left in his proverbial tank. Cruz started boxing when he was eight. He reportedly had 85 amateur fights, turned pro at 16, and yes, just 22 years old, has already had 21 pro bouts. His father and trainer, Isak Sr., his two uncles and grandfather also boxed. In fact, his grandpa, Guillermo, was one of the few to beat Hall of Famer Pepino Cuevas in May of 1973. Take a look at the numbers that Taylor made for this fight. And one of the key numbers to zero in on is the age of Magdaleno. Morrow mentioned uh, that at 34, he thinks he has something more to offer. But how much did that loss to Tiafimo Lopez take out of him? We're going to find out tonight. And the rules for our fights tonight, no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. A fighter cannot be saved by the bell in any round. If an accidental foul or headbutt causes a fight to end within four rounds, it's a no decision. After four, they go to the scorecards for a technical decision. It's time for the official introductions. Here's Hall of Fame ring announcer, Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to you and welcome to the Alamo Dome here in the beautiful city of San Antonio, Texas. 
Premier Boxing Champions presents our big night of action coming away, and it's all brought to you by Mayweather Promotions, TGB Promotions, GTD Promotions, Santa Cruz Boxing Club, and Showtime. Sponsored by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. And O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. This bow to the ring is sanctioned by the IBF. The president is Daryl Peoples. Introducing at this time our judges all from the state of Texas. Joel Elizondo, Ellis Johnson, and Rafael Ramos. Introducing our third man of the ring, the referee in charge of the action, Mark Calloway. All right, fans, here we go. 12 rounds of boxing scheduled for an IBF lightweight world title eliminator. Introducing you first on my left, fighting out of the red corner, wearing red trunks with silver trim, hailing from Las Vegas, Nevada. He weighed in at 134 and three quarter pounds. His record stands at 32 wins, three losses, with 13 wins coming by way of knockout. Here is the former world title challenger and veteran standout contender, introducing uh, Diego Tufuego. And his opponent across the ring, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black trunks with gold trim, hailing from Mexico City, La Ciudad de Mexico. He weighed in at a trade rate of 132 pounds. His record stands at 19 wins, one loss and one draw, with 14 wins coming by way of knockout. Currently ranked the IBF number six lightweight world contender and known as Mini Tyson, introducing Isak Pitbull. Once again, referee in charge, Mark Kalahoy, now to give instructions. Dressing room, I want you to obey my commands at all times. Escúchame todo el tiempo, okay? Aquí, golpes aquí para arriba está bien. Golpes, these are a little high. Golpes right here, para arriba está bien, okay? Chuck and guantes, buena suerte. Referee Mark Calloway, a 13-year veteran working his 294th professional bout, kicking off this four-fight fiesta on pay-per-view from the Box. Alamo Dome. Isak Cruz in the black and gold trunks. Diego Magdaleno, red with silver trim. And boy, that name, Diego arriba, Tufuego arriba, Isaac, Magdaleno arriba, rolls right off the tongue. He's hoping these punches will roll right off his body. And this is exactly what we thought this, this match would be. Cruz throws 68 punches. Oh. Right and look what he did already. Definitely not in Cruz Three. control as he sends Four. Magdaleno down to the canvas. Five. Six, seven, eight. Diego sat there too comfortable. Give he he was taking too much shots. He, he had to move. And in just the opening 30 seconds of the first round, Magdaleno goes down to the canvas for the 11th time in his Lopez career. Lopez. And we have fistic fireworks to kick off this four fight fiesta. It's all Esau Cruz. Right up a cut, another right up a cut. And Magdaleno goes down and out. Okay, okay. Mamma mia, what a start! Magdaleno may be known as Two Fuego, but it's Isak Cruz who is in Fuego tonight! You got him? You got him, Doc? A scary stoppage to kick off Halloween night at the Alamo Dome. Esau Cruz with his 15th knockout 
Yeah. Incredible stuff on display this evening, Al. Yeah, very, uh, uh, for this young man who many people believe at age 22 already a six-year veteran is special. And for Diego Magdaleno, if this is the end of his career, a tough ending at 34, he was hoping to show a lot more than this tonight. Hopefully he's going to be fine and, and they'll take good care of him. That was Bones Adams in his first fight with Magdaleno as his trainer. And this did not go the way they planned, of course. As for Cruz at 22, he's a six-year veteran, and he showed why he is a diminutive lightweight. But I'll tell you what, he's got power, and man, can he throw punches to the body. Abner? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I was really looking forward to see uh, what Diego was, you know, going to bring in with having Adams in his in his corner. Um, but unfortunately, you know, what well, you know, not unfortunately, you know, it happens. Isaac Cruz, he's the younger fighter, the shorter fighter. I, I thought he was going to, well, he, he did what he had to do. He got a, he had to go in there and, and throw bombs, and th that's what he did. And um, what a performance from Isaac Cruz. I, I was impressed. Only 22 years of age records his 20th victory is now 15-0-1 since his lone defeat. Take a look at the first knockdown. This came so quick uh, out of the gate. Magdaleno got to a place you don't want to be against Cruz on the ropes. Cruz is very good at mixing his body, his attack to the body and the head. Normally he lands half his punches to the body. That was the beautiful uppercut that sent Magdaleno down. And you know, Magdaleno, as you pointed out, Morrow has been down many times in his career. So you get the feeling still at this point, he could get himself back together and, and maybe still make things work. But, and he, we take a look at it again, the first knockdown, and you'll see how it happened. Uh, working from a good distance, Abner. It was the first round. I think Diego got too comfortable. He said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna feel this punch. I'm gonna take his punches and see what this kid has. But it, unfortunately, he had power and, and took uh, Diego out. Yeah, that was the first knockdown. And then here is where we'll see the end of the fight. The body work, and again, the uppercut of Cruz. You know, I thought Magdaleno's uppercut was going to be a weapon in this fight. Turned out Cruz's was much more effective, and uh, and he sent Magdaleno down, and that was that. Well, that's the that's a punch you throw right, right when you work the body, especially to the side. You make that opening now, and that's what he threw, the uppercut, and it was there. Beautiful punch. He saw Cruz, known as Mini Mike Tyson, showcase that vicious uppercut. Hey, another Mini Mike Tyson, known for <laughs> his vicious uppercuts, known for being a player here in the 135 pound division. That name, Gervonta Tank Davis, he headlines tonight against Leo Santa Cruz, but he saw Cruz adding his name to the mix. A lot of young guns at 135. Let's make it official with the one and only Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of 53 seconds of round number one. He is the winner by way of knockout. He is the winner of the IBF lightweight world title eliminator, Isak Pitbull Cruz. A family affair indeed, and a happy Cruz family celebrating a stunning first round KO victory here tonight. Well, Showtime Championship Boxing has a lot of history here in the walls of the Alamo Dome. Let's take a look at some of those memorable moments. Deep in the heart of Texas stands the Alamo Dome, the massive stadium in San Antonio, opened in May of 1993, and it wasn't long before boxing's biggest attraction came to town. The pride of Mexico, Julio Cesar Chavez, brought more than 60,000 fans with him when he fought fellow pound-for-pound -pound great Pernell Whitaker in September of 93. Whitaker landing to the head of Chavez. The seemingly invincible Julio Cesar Chavez undefeated 87 and 0. 
Whitaker oozing with confidence. It could be history in the making. The decision is a majority draw. A draw, and you can see the reaction of Sweet P. Whitaker. 20 years later, the Alamo Dome again played host to prize fighting at the highest level. 40,000 fight fanatics flocked to the unique venue to support Canelo Alvarez as he faced Austin Trout in a highly anticipated unification bout. And there is Canelo dropping Trout with a straight right! And Canelo now on the attack, looking for the home run. Trout trying to survive another overhand right, a counter left from Trout. Canelo demanded this fight. Canelo passes the test, recording a unanimous decision win. Later that same year, it was a site for one of the most dramatic upsets of 2013. And there's the right hand lead by Maidana that sticks oh! another right hand. Broder goes down for the first time in his career. And they are exchanging leather in the center of the ring. They go down the stretch in what has been a terrific fight. Problem solved. The Alamo Dome has roofed several extraordinary moments of the pugilistic kind. And tonight, Gervonta Davis and Leo Santa Cruz will add another chapter of fistic fireworks to its legacy. Well, someone who's going to remember the Alamo Dome is Isak Cruz, victorious in our opening contest, and he is standing by with our Felix De Jesus. Thanks, Mauro. Wow, what a fight to start this pay-per-view. We're with the winner, Isak Cruz. Isak, you beat him in 53 seconds. Nobody expected this kind of fight. Isak, le ganaste en 53 segundos. ¿Tú esperabas esta pelea hoy? Bueno, no puedo, no puedo describir toda esta felicidad que, que acabo de, de ganar en, ante un gran peleador, ante Diego Magdaleno. Y bueno, esta victoria es dedicada a mi esposa, a mi hijo y a toda la gente que me está apoyando. Todo este triunfo es para toda esta hermosa gente. San Antonio has come out today for him for this big fight. He's surprised, of course, but he was ready for this kind of fight. He made, of course, his nickname today, Pitbull, stand out today. Saliste como un Pitbull hoy. ¿Por qué la razón de tan rápido frente a Diego Magdaleno? Bueno, yo esperaba una pelea más dura, pero mi, mi preparación y mis ganas de disputar un título mundial fue lo que me sacó avante. Y bueno, ¿qué, qué más mejor darle un nocaud a esta toda esta hermosa público del Alamo Dom? I expected the, uh, I came prepared for this fight. Uh, I, I was surprised that it was definitely a quicker fight, but that's what I'm looking for, a world title, that's what I want. Isaac, uh, the last question is here. Who do you want to fight next? Contra quien quiere pelear próximamente? Pues ahorita no, no tengo palabras, no quisiera enfrentar a todo el mundo, pero bueno, mi promotor Shen Jibun Simani Pacquiao está en sus manos mi carrera y confío en ellos. I'm thinking about this victory I had tonight. I'm not worried of my next opponent, but my promoter will handle that. Back to ringside. All right, Felix, that uh, victory as sweet as any candy that will be digested tonight. We just witnessed a Roman candle go off in the form of Isak Cruz. Back to you, Brian Custer. Okay, Mo. Hey, look, that's how you start off a pay-per-view show here in front of fans. The first major boxing event in front of fans. You know, Isak Cruz told us my family has a dynasty and a legacy when it comes to fighting. Of course, his father, his grandfather, he said tonight, is about me writing my own history. He certainly did that with a fantastic stoppage here in the first round. We are just underway here at the Alamo Dome. Coming up next, Houston resident Regis Rugaru Progre takes on the unbeaten Juan Araldez in a 10 round super lightweight fight. And then in the co main event, it's an all Texas tussle as WBA super lightweight champion Mario El Estaca Barrios defends against the Cowboy Ryan Carl and then later the main event Gervonta Tank Davis takes on Leo Santa Cruz for the WBA lightweight and super featherweight titles. You know in June when Leo was training for this fight his father and trainer Jose came down with a severe case of COVID-19. You know, Jose was already battling bone cancer and undergoing chemotherapy, but the coronavirus hospitalized him for over a month and nearly took his life. You know, Leo said he would have withdrawn from this fight 
if his father hadn't pulled through because his father is the reason why he fights. Leo believes he's inherited his father's warrior spirit and just his presence gives Leo confidence that he can stop a tank. We grew up a really poor family. My dad was the only one working and he worked as a dishwasher. And it was really hard because there were times that we didn't have to pay the bills. They used to cut the electric off, so we had to buy candles and that would be our light. My dad, he used to say, my kids, you know, they're really good and they're gonna become world champions. I'm gonna be able to buy my dream car when they make it. And people used to say about him that poor guy, he was crazy. My dad means the world to me. And hearing those things, yeah, you know, motivated me and I say, hey, I'm gonna do this for my dad. Take a look at 23-year-old Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is setting a pace hunting that's ridiculous. He's just so busy. What does it mean for you to win this title? This is uh, what I've been training for since I was eight years old. This was always my dream, and it was my dad's dream. It was just a regular day, and my dad, he just told me that he couldn't breathe. When he got to the hospital, they did a test on him, and he came out positive for COVID. They put him in ventilator, and his heart stopped. The doctors are saying that he's not gonna pass the night, that only a miracle could help him, that if you guys have faith to pray. We were heartbroken, we were crying. And I said, man, I wish I could have said goodbye to him that one last time. I could have hugged them and said I love them. The doctors told us that he died twice. But I said, you know, if God, you know, does the miracle and brings him back to us, I'm gonna get that tattoo of him so he could see that I, you know, remember him and that I have him with me in my heart. The next day came and he was getting a little better and better. We couldn't believe it. <sighs> and that was a big relief, you know, to all of us, to the whole family. I learned the strength from my dad because he's a really tough guy. Every time he's in pain, he tried not to show it, but deep inside, I know he's hurting. My dad wanted this fight. He said I could beat him. He, he believes in me so much, so I want to make him proud. People were saying that I was scared to fight big names, big opponents. And so I said, Tank Davis, if I call him out and they make that fight happen, that proves that I'm not scared of nobody, that I'm here to fight the best. This is the moment I've been training all my life for. Santa Cruz looking to light him up like the Las Vegas Strip. I heard people say that I'm too small for Tank, that he's gonna knock me out. I don't care, I know what I got. I know what I could go out there and do for my dad to be with me in this fight after what we've been through. This is what I always dreamed of. I feel I have that spirit, I have that heart to go out there and show the world who I am. A great Mexican warrior. Here's a look at Leo arriving with his father there, Jose in the wheelchair and his brother Antonio uh, with him. You know, Leo's father will not be able to get on the apron and give Leo instruction in between rounds. Jose will be seated in that wheelchair near ringside and close to Leo's corner. So that means Leo's brother Antonio, who trained him for most of this camp, will handle the end fight instructions. You know, Leo says the best advice his father gave him for this fight was don't get carried away, just move, box, use the jab in length, and remember, this is a winnable fight. And here, it's Tank Davis arriving at the Alamo Dome. You know, Tank says he's grateful that Leo called him out and asked for this fight because it forced him to mature and, you know, really make some changes. Gervonta, he trained over 12 weeks for this fight instead of his customary eight-week camp. 
with really the whole camp in Las Vegas and most of it alongside Floyd Mayweather. Tank says he did it to make sure that he would be sharp, in shape, and ready to put on a spectacular performance where this becomes the first of many pay-per-view fights for him. It's Gervonta Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz. It's the main event. It's later tonight from the Alamo Dome here in San Antonio. But first, here's a look at an upcoming series on Showtime. Our water tank is empty. I've started up the urine recycling machine. <laughs> That's very salty. Why did you want to go to the moon? Carry on the legacy of my father. It helped spread the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the universe. We've all made mistakes. We've all had failed marriages. We've all had helicopter tour businesses go belly up because we didn't pay our taxes. But we are going to the moon. Yeah, we are. Well, we know the fighters are over the moon with an opportunity to fight in front of a crowd, socially distanced, of course, but here we are in unique times getting set for what should be another thrilling tilt. Ten rounds or less to determine the winner in this 140-pound tussle. Regis Progre has faced titleists in his last three bouts, four of his last five. In his last fight, a world title unification bout a year ago this week, Progre endured his first setback via majority decision against Josh Taylor in what was one of the best tear-ups of 2019. Now, despite the hard-fought loss, Progre elevated himself with his performance and professionalism. His opponent, the 30-year-old Eraldez, he is 16-0-1 with the draw coming in his last fight in May 2019 against 140 or 30-pound title holder in the past, Arenas Mendez. And there is Araldez, who, like Progre, well, natural disasters have impacted both of their lives. Araldez's family left California, San Fernando Valley, due to earthquake activity, while Hurricane Katrina forced Progre and his family to leave New Orleans for Texas. And our thoughts are with those who have been impacted by Hurricane Zeta that slammed into the Gulf Coast this week. Araldez, he is looking to stay unbeaten and make a statement at the expense of one of the best at 140. Now, Pro Gray, well, only fitting that a guy who's nicknamed Rougarou, a.k.a. Cajun Werewolf, is making his pay-per-view debut on All Hallows' Eve. More importantly, his wife, Hakel, is set to debut their third child, a daughter, any time now. And, and Al, I know we're going to be going to the numbers here. You wonder, no excuse not to make weight, but he's expecting the birth of another child. Yeah, you know, there's no question that's on his mind. And did that impact? Well, as we look at the tail of the tape and we figure out, you know, what may have caused this, he did come in at 141 and a half pounds. Obviously, 140 is the limit. He will lose some cash because of that. And, of course, another point is he wants to fight at 140 for a world title. So not making the weight diminishes him just a little bit. Here's Jimmy Lennon, Jr., well, fans from the Alamo Dome here in San Antonio, Texas, Premier Boxing Champions presents our next attraction in the ring, brought to you by Mayweather Promotions, TGB Promotions, GTD Promotions, Santa Cruz Boxing Club, and Showtime. Sponsored by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online, O'ReillyAuto.com, and get free curbside pickup. Introducing our three judges, scoring from ringside, all from the state of Texas, Gregorio Alvarez, Joel Elizondo, and Ellis Johnson. Introducing our referee in charge, he'll be giving instructions after the introductions, Rafael Ramos. All right, fans, here we go. Ten rounds of boxing scheduled in a super lightweight special attraction. Introducing to you first on my left, fighting out of the red corner, entering the ring wearing white trunks with silver and blue trim, fighting out of his home of Las Vegas, Nevada. Yeah. He weighed in at 139 and one half pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign in the ring with a record of 16 wins, no losses, one draw with 10 wins coming by way of knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the crafty and highly skilled contender introducing the undefeated Juan Heraldez. 
and his opponent across the ring on my right, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black trunks, red trim, a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, now fighting out of Katy, Texas. He weighed in at 141 and one half pounds. His record is a fine one at 24 wins, one loss, 20 wins coming by way of knockout. He is currently ranked number two in the WBC, number four in the WBA. Here is the former WBA super lightweight champion of the world, introducing the hard-hitting Regis Rougarou Pro Gray. Once again, a referee in charge now to give instructions, Rafael Ramos. Okay, guys, you received the pre flight instruction. Protect yourself, obey my command, give me a clean fight. Let's do it. Referee Rafael Ramos, 30 years of pro experience. This is his 482nd professional bout scheduled for 10 rounds in the 140 pound division. And I say that even though Regis Progray came in overweight and despite the fact that he says he wants to win another title or all the belts at 140, it's obvious his future is probably at 147. Progray in the black with red trim, Eraldez in the white with silver and blue trim. Yeah, this is a big step up fight for Eraldez, who by the way comes in after that 17 month layoff, the longest of his career. and. He just hasn't faced a fighter on Pro Gray's level yet. He's 30 years old. It's time for that, and that's what he's doing tonight. Pro Gray has that intrinsic star appeal, oozes charisma, an adrenaline junkie who, in fact, loves to spearfish off the coast of Malibu. He can hold his breath underwater for nearly four minutes. So despite coming in overweight, conditioning should probably not be an issue. I'll say. <laughs> I want to say that maybe that was baby weight. You know, the wife was pregnant and, you know, he was doing most of the eating. <laughs> well done, Abner. Well done. <laughs> but uh, listen, uh, from Progress, uh, you know, what I've seen from Progress, obviously, he's just started the fight. But, you know, from uh, his last fights, he's, he's got great head movement, but he's flat footed sometimes. He moves his torso, he moves his head, but he's too flat footed. He stays stationary. So, Geraldis should be more of a pressure fighter and push uh, Progress back. Interesting, Eraldez criticized the footwork of Ridges Progray. There's an overhand left by Progray, and again, he still does not know. His wife has yet to give birth. We checked in with the corner, so what a, a night, what an atmosphere, what a what an evening it could turn into for Regis Progray here against Eraldez and uh, about to become a dad again. And Progray got the attention of Eraldez with that straight left, and he has power in that left hand, and he showed it already and you know he lands 42 percent of his power punches progray which is everything other than a jab and we saw evidence there there are levels to this sport and already progray showing that he may be at a completely different level than eraldez coming forward with that left hand oozing all kinds of confidence abner yeah and and this herald expecting the uh, left up and sometimes he tries to avoid that punch he goes down and progray comes in with the uppercut as a left so you know he's landing both really well and progray would be the first to tell you he is at a different level being durable being able to take a punch that's something most people don't have it's like a gift he said that god blesses everybody with a gift he feels his is he can't get hurt <laughs> he certainly dealt with the pressure of josh taylor in that very close and excellent fight yes Eraldez trying to establish the jab trying to keep pro gray's offense at bay in the final 15 seconds of a good opening round for Rougarou. Oh, and a left hand again that connects. And it's there all day for Regis Progray. Let's take a look at the keys to victory for these men, and we will begin with Regis Progray. Eraldez likes a more controlled pace, and Progray should accelerate it, which he did in round one. Now, Progray is an excellent body puncher, and I think he's going to want to go down there. His left hand is a big power punch, and we saw evidence of that in round number one. So you're letting him circle out that way. And for Eraldez. Uh, now, he likes to uh, frame everything with a strong jab, but he didn't get that punch in much in round one. 
Sometimes he leaves his head up and exposed. We did see that, unfortunately, in round one. He has a good straight right hand, and he used it to beat another lefty, Jose Borrego, uh, recently, and he'll want to get that punch in here tonight if he can. Pick it up. The bell in round two, and yes, in progress, Heraldez fighting his first left-handed opponent since August 2017. Now, when he handed the favored Borrego his first loss via 10-round decision. Meanwhile, Regis Progre, he um, really made a name for himself on Showbox, went 4-0 from 2015 to 2017, one of 83 Showbox alum to win a world title. That is a proving ground for fighters. And, and Stephen Farhood is smiling ear to ear beside yeah. him here. One once they get the Steve Farhood uh, a nod of <laughs> approval, they know they can be champions. And Progre has all the tools, has proven that he can be a champion. And a highly debated decision, but really one of the best fights of 2019 in that fight against Taylor, but a terrific start here for Regis Progre. Eraldez really needs to get himself into this bout, do something good. Now there, he's trying combinations, and that's that's what he's going to want to do. He's an economical puncher. Uh, he doesn't throw a lot of punches, only averages around 45 per round. But he may have to have uptick that volume a little bit in this match. Definitely, and he is a pressure fighter. Most of his fights, he's pressuring back. Um, he give, he's giving Progre too much respect. And despite him saying that on paper, this is his toughest fight, but in reality, it's not. Uh, he's faced uh, tougher positions, he, he, he said, he claims, but he needs to prove that in this fight. He has to push a pro grade back. I don't know if they get much better at this weight class yeah. than Rugaru Regis Progre, 24 and 1, 20 knockouts in his last five fights. Combined record of 113 and 4, his opponents, four of them have been champions or were champions in their careers. He is an upper crust talent, as they say. Yeah, he really is, and because he's looking for a 140-pound uh, title fight, and uh, maybe he wants to get in there against the winner of uh, Mario Barrios and uh, Ryan Carl. Well, I, would love, I would love to see the rematch with Taylor as well. Final yeah. minute of the second round, and it continues to be Regis Progre having his way with a Raldez. Raldez trying to establish the jab, but even as a range finder, he's not finding the range. Well, he's got to continue to do that despite him not landing it. I mean, at least he's had he's having pro great think, you know, he's, he's got him on the distance and that's when he needs to make him pay right there when he throws that left. That's what that's when Heraldis should come in with his with his right. Heraldez suffering the first blemish on his career in his last fight, the 10-round uh, majority draw against former 130-pound belt holder Arhenis Mendez. And final seconds, and again, Regis Progre with that left hand and the defense on display. It's all Progre through two. You see what I'm saying? It's good work. Lean back and relax. Yeah, let's kick those feet. Pull this out. Good. Still, every now and then, you letting him circle to that left side, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's why we're not getting our hands moving. Okay. You're making him miss all that shit, but you're just a little bit out of range. If you circle to your right side, you'll be able to, you'll be able to counter him every time. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. Deep breath. Okay. You look different. Okay. All right. Yeah. Everything we worked on, we're not letting it go out the window. Keep working on what you want to do, all right? Listen, I'm proud of you. Let me just suck it up and make this motherfucker go backwards. Okay. All right? Okay. You got to make him go backwards. Keep him on his back foot. But when you finish on the inside, give me a left hook or a hook to the body. Okay. Hook to the body with a left. That's a voice of former pro middleweight, light heavyweight Otis Pimpleton in Eraldez's corner, while Bobby Benton is the chief second in pro Gray's corner as we begin round at number three, scheduled for 10. And that was just at the belt level. 
You know, Raldez grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, his family had moved there. And he always felt that was a big advantage. You know, he got to spar with people like Jorge Linares, Canelo, Floyd Mayweather, uh, among others. And he said the boxing atmosphere there helped him. And he's hoping that's the kind of thing that can push him through here tonight. Yeah, he sparred with Floyd Mayweather, preparing him for the first Maidana fight and his uh, fight with Andre Berto. Signed with Mayweather Promotions in December of 2014. Was reportedly discovered by former champion, mm -hmm. Trainer Cornelius yep. Boza Edwards as he lands a couple of lefts on Pro Grade. Pro Grade rolling with oh, and just like that, Herodes is down with that sniper Five, left hand. Six, seven, eight. Come forward. Move. This way. Come on, let's go. And I don't know if Herodes is steady on his feet, gets caught with the left, another left, and he is moving like a shopping cart right now, courtesy of Pro Ray's attack. Clubbing lefts by Regis Pro Ray Herodes trying to stave off the onslaught, and the referee steps in. It's over. Pro Ray is victorious. Make it 25 and 1 with 21 wins via form of knockout. And Eraldez goes down to defeat for the first time in 18 pro fights. We just program wanted to come back after the Taylor fight uh, and do something dramatic. He did that. Eraldez moving up in class, and he just couldn't get the job done here. And it was right when Juan Herodes was doing something nice. He yeah. threw a nice combination, uh, was having pro grade going backwards, but it was when he pulled back that that left and landed right in the chin. Well, the straight left hand, we just talked about it in the keys. It, it, it's just a big, powerful punch for Regis Progray. And, uh, and when he hits you with it flush, he's going to lock a lot of people out. Good work, son. Welcome back, baby. We'll get a couple of looks at the knockdown uh, and how Pro Gray was able to get Geraldes in such trouble. They told me I was there. I'm telling you, I'm the fucking best at 140. I keep telling you, I'm getting my shit, but I'm getting my belts back. Regis is a likable and fascinating guy, as he shows you there, doing his own commentary. We take a look. This is from the overhead look, and you'll we're going to see how he lands that left hand of Eraldez just keeping his right hand very low, and when you do that against Progre, he is going to take advantage of that. And it really, it didn't look like Eraldez was going to be uh, coming back from that, Abner. No, and, and it was right before, like I mentioned, that where Eraldez had landed his own, but a great way, a, a great way of Progre keeping his own left and, and the outside and, and keep in making the right adjustment to land that left hand. Well, that is the big power punch always for Regis Progre, and uh, he senses it. You can see right there. He probably is kind of looking up at the screen <laughs> to see the knockdown here at the Alamo Dome. And then here is where the fight would end. Uh, the referee looking on, and Eraldis had not done much. Very close to going down right there, and that's when uh, referee Ramos says, no, nope, I don't think so. And no real complaint from Eraldis. So um, you get the feeling it was appropriate. Regis Progre delivers the victory as he awaits news of his wife delivering their third child. It could be happening at any moment. What a memorable night for Regis Progre. Let's go to Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of 1 minute 23 seconds of round number three. Our referee in charge, Rafael Ramos, stops the contest. He is the winner by way of technical knockout, Regis Rougarou Progre. Regis Progre with a dramatic win here, making a statement after uh, his 
close loss to Josh Taylor and using his power uh, to beat Araldez who took a step up but could not do it in the style he wanted. And even though his fight was short, the numbers do tell the story because 34 uh, percent landed total. And I mentioned at the beginning that Progre normally lands 42 percent of his power punches, which is everything other than a jab. Guess what? Tonight he landed 56 percent. And one of those 28 uh, punches was the big, powerful left hand that sent Araldez down. And that was the most important punch, certainly, of this fight. And it was the one that gave Regis Progre an excellent win here this evening. Let's look inside the ropes to, uh, and we'll go back and remind you that in the keys to victory, we had the left hand is an important weapon for Progre. That he started to get that punch on Limbered earlier even in the fight. They're jabbing to the uh, to the body, and as we pointed out in the keys to victory, the left hand an important weapon for him. And he delivered it here in a number of different ways, using the jab, and in that case, the low right hand for Araldez gave a big opening to Regis Progre, and he was able to score the one knockdown of this fight, and it would lead to the stoppage. With Regis Progre, let's go to Mauro Ronaldo. All right, Al, thank you so very much. And uh, Regis, first of all, congratulations on the win. I got to ask you, uh, why the difficulty making weight? Um, you know, I've been out the I've been out the um, ring for a whole year, so I think that had that had some type of effect on me. And then the whole bubble thing kind of messed me up too. You know, we couldn't, of course, no excuses because all the other fighters they made weight, but you know, we didn't work out on Tuesday, so you know, I think that that played effect to it. But I think the main thing is my layoff. I've been out the ring for over a year now, so I, you know, and my my body wasn't used to adjusting to making the weight. So I think you know that played a part with it. Did the fact your wife Hakel is about to deliver at any moment have anything to do with it? Um, nah, you know. I, she she told me just get it over with, you know, because um she's due any moment now, and I live in Katy, Texas now, so that's like a two-hour drive. So most likely after um after the main event, I'm gonna get on the road and I'm I'm gonna shoot home. Well, we won't keep you long, but again, talking about the 140-pound division, you say you want all the belts at 140 before moving up. You had one of the best fights of the year against Josh Taylor last year. You have Mario Barrios about to defend a secondary title of 140. What do you see in your future when it comes to the belts in your career? Um, I still feel like I'm the best at 140. I'm not gonna lie, you know, I'm gonna keep coming out there and proving it every time I fight. You know, me and Taylor, we had a we had a real, real close fight. I think I'm not gonna make excuses, but I think that if it was here, I think I would have gotten the decision. Um, but anyways, I definitely me and me and Josh Taylor, we have to have a rematch. We know that's gonna happen one day if even as even if at 140 or 147 and um but hey right now it's up to our manager whatever we want to do money and belts that's what we care about so whatever last word on your performance tonight what did you think of uh, how it turned out for you? It went pretty well. Yeah, it went pretty well, man. I congratulate um, Juan Haraldez, man. You know, he, I think he was, you know, it was, a, it was a tough opponent for me to get back in for over a year. I had a year layoff, you know, so that's a long time. But I'm just glad to be back. And, um, you know, this, this win is actually for my grandpa. My grandpa, Cleville Martinez, he died. He was 92 years old. He died on the, the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, which was August 29th. And he died. And, you know, this is for my grandpa. Condolences, but congratulations not only on the victory, but on becoming a father for the third time. Get back to your home. Congratulations, Regis Program. Let's go back to Vincent. Well, you see the personality and uh, of Regis Progre, and of course, he's got a lot on his mind, what with his wife getting ready to deliver. Uh, and so, as he said, he'll get back to Katy, Texas for the most important thing, perhaps, of the evening, even though this was certainly a big win for him and uh, puts him back into the picture in the 140 pound division uh, at age 31. He's got lots of good years ahead of him and he hopes that he can get in uh, to another world title shot here pretty soon. And now let's send things back to Brian. Okay, Al, thank you. Hard to argue that Ruji's Progre, one of the best at 140 pounds. Uh, you know what? How about this? Adrian Broner. Uh, in the house tonight. He said he would love to tangle with Adrian Broner. Wouldn't that be something if they could get it on at 140? Uh, our next fight, matter of fact, speaking of 140, is a tangle of a couple of Texans. There's the champion, San Antonio's own Mario Barrios. He will put his WBA super lightweight title on the line against another Texan, the Cowboy, Ryan Carl. 
as he warms up with his trainer Ronnie Shields an all Texas tangle at 140 pounds that one is coming up next already two fights two stoppages it's going to be an explosive night here in the Alamo Dome. Well as I said coming up next the co-main event the unbeaten San Antonio native and WBA super lightweight champion Mario Barrios defending his title against the hard hitting cowboy Ryan Carl and still to come it's the main event Gervonta Davis versus Leo Santa Cruz with the WBA lightweight and super featherweight titles on the line. You know Gervonta Davis is one of the sports most popular young stars. He has become a headline fighter and has well over two million followers on social media. You know Gervonta believes the tank appeal is not necessarily just about his personality but his life story and the place where he comes from the 410 of West Baltimore a city that has forced him to fight his entire life and toughened him so much that Davis believes no one can beat him. We living in the middle of the hood. You got gangs, you got shootings. I'm really one of them inner city kids that been around. People know me, see me coming back. People seeing us on TV and things like that. It gives the people hope. When I had the billboard up, I think it showed a lot of people uh, anything is possible because I'm one of them guys that I really came from the inner city. Tank came through the amateurs. He didn't go to the Olympics, didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth. You know what I'm saying? He came from the, the dirt with this. Somebody got killed right here. I think that's his name. They tried to rob him, and you know, um, he tried to fight back, so they shot him. They shot him to death. And they killed him right here. I'd be always committed with something. And I was watching it over and over, and they was getting killed like, over and over. So as I was younger, it was time for me to man up. But I should definitely save my life. And he puts him down with the left hand. Young kid walked up to me. He had that, that killer in his eyes, that go-getter, the same look I had to become champion at a young age. I'm grateful for what Floyd did for me, opening the doors for me. He gave him the chance to fight on his pay-per-view card. Now we're here. My own pay-per-view. Watch out, get your hands back. I've been his age. And what he's trying to go to and what he's trying to accomplish, I've already accomplished. Oh, and down goes Gamboa. Whoop, there it is. But the ultimate goal is to get him to surpass me. Is this a sign of what's to come in the final round as Davis comes to life? Line him up and we'll keep knocking him down. Davis smokes Gamboa like a Cuban cigar, drops him for the third and final time. That's gonna be a good matchup, and that's what boxing is about. The best fighting the best. This is a big step up. Pay-per-view fighting an elite fighter now, fighting Leo, four-time world champion. Sam Cruz, perfect opponent, get what I'm saying? I watch his achievements, amazing. Knowing his style and knowing my style, I know it's gonna be a exciting fight. This fight right here will show the world all the work that we put in to make this possible. When you put his fighting skills with the guts and glory, myself along with the rest of his team, natural born superstar. Love it. At the end of the day, we the same right now. We undefeated. And this fight is over! And that's what we do, we kick ass. It's just not about boxing. It's letting the, the, the youngins know if you put your mind to it and really work hard, anything is possible. Put the right people around you, anything is possible. If you have one feet in the streets and one feet in the gym, it's not gonna work. You gotta be always committed with something. Let me introduce it. Gervonta, three-time world champion, Tank Davis. Well, there he is. That's a live look there inside Gervonta's dressing room. And look at that, his promoter, Floyd Money Mayweather, giving him some instructions there 
as he gets ready for this main event. You know, Javante says his camp in Las Vegas really had him so focused that he just may end up being there permanently and moving there. Uh, he said he will definitely set up his training camps in Vegas instead of Baltimore in the near future. In fact, Tank says his goal in this fight cut down on Leo's punch output and make him want to brawl with him instead of trying to stay on the outside and box as he gets those last minute instructions from Floyd Mayweather. Leo Santa Cruz getting ready says staying focused is what his father has preached to him in this fight. Don't stand in front of Tank. Use your pivot. Circle the ring. Stay alert. Avoid Tank's uppercut and circle that ring. Stay alert. Avoid Tank's uppercut off the break and watch that right hook because Jose Santa Cruz believes Davis loads up when he throws it. And more importantly, Jose Toledo not to make Tank out to be a bigger puncher than what he really is. You know, our coverage here from the Alamo Dome continues in just a moment. Davis versus Santa Cruz is being brought to you by Showtime Pay-Per-View, by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. And by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. I tell you what, here inside the Alamo Dome, first major boxing event with fans in attendance, of course, socially distanced, but you can feel the electricity, the excitement. Boxing is back, and I tell you what, we've had two fights both of them knockouts. It's going to be an explosive night here in San Antonio, one of the real great fight cities in America. Showtime has had a storied history here inside the Alamo Dome, and it looks like we are on track to write another chapter tonight. Well, right now, it's time for the co-main event of the evening. Mario Barrios, Ryan Carl. Here's Mo. Thank you very much, Brian. Yes, the first of uh, two title tilts coming your way tonight on pay-per-view. Both men coming off career-long layoffs. And uh, the unbeaten Barrios making the first defense of his secondary 140-pound title he claimed in his last fight against Batir Akhmedov. Meanwhile, Carl, he has won three straight since his most recent loss, all via stoppage. And the first of those wins, a fifth-round TKO of Kevin Watts, avenged a fifth-round TKO Carl suffered against Watts. And there is the cowboy who fell in love with boxing when he was 11, had a reported 128 amateur fights, went into his most recent fight last November with an injured right hand. Ironically, Carl, who was dropped in the first round due to a right hand one when his opponent Bergman Aguilar surrendered with a broken left hand he says he's not the type of fighter to go in there and wait a bunch of rounds to come on everybody knows that he's here to fight this man Mario Barrios who has been a practitioner of the sweet science since the age of six mom and dad enrolled him and his older sister Selena in a boxing program he started competing as soon as he turned eight and uh, he has the name Travel Mazion on his trunks tonight dedicating this fight to the 24 year old undefeated 154 pound prospect who was killed in a car accident in July Barrios absolutely thrilled to have fans in attendance for this homecoming title defense Defense. Take a look at the numbers for this match. Now, normally, Barrios has a height and a reach advantage on his opponent. Here, it's pretty much the same. They're both big men, and let me tell you something else. Pretty good work in the corners. Virgil Hunter in the corner of Barrios, Ronnie Shields in the corner of Ryan Carl. A lot of good things will be said to these fighters. Here's Jimmy Lennon Jr. 
Ladies and gentlemen from the Alamo Dome here in San Antonio, Texas, Premier Boxing Champions presents the first of our world title attractions brought to you by Mayweather Promotions, TGB Promotions, GTD Promotions, Santa Cruz Boxing Club, and Showtime. Sponsored by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. This bout is sanctioned by the WBA, the President, Gilberto Jesus Mendoza, Supervisor in attendance, Julio Time. Introducing our three judges scoring from ringside. From Texas, Ruben Carrion. Also from Texas, Wilfredo Esperon. And from Puerto Rico, Jose Roberto Torres. Introducing our referee in charge of the action, introducing Luis Pabon. All right, fans, here we go with the co-main event of the evening. 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Super Lightweight Championship of the World. Introducing to you first, the challenger fighting out of the red corner, entering the ring wearing black trunks with multicolor trim and hailing from Milano, Texas. He weighed in at the super lightweight limit of 140 pounds. His record 18 wins, two losses, with 12 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight making his first attempt at a world title, here is the WBA number nine ranked world contender, introducing a cowboy, Ryan Carl. And his opponent across the ring is the defending world champion fighting out of the blue corner, wearing purple and black trunks, hailing from and representing his home of San Antonio, Texas. He weighed in at 139 and one half pounds. He is undefeated in his campaign to the ring with a record of 25 wins, no losses, 16 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, making the first defense of his recently earned title, here is the undefeated, reigning and defending WBA Super Lightweight Champion of the World, introducing Mario El Azteca Barrios. And our free in charge now to give instructions, Luis Pabon. Okay, guys, I give you instruction in the dressing room. Let's have a clean match, okay? Good luck, God bless you. Referee Luis Pabon, 27th year as a pro. This is his 497th professional fight. It is for Mario Barrios' secondary 140 pound title. The bell in round one and the belt That's holder Barrios in the purple with black and gray trim. The challenger Carl in the multicolored trunks. These guys know each other very well, uh, traveling the same amateur circuit, living near each other, uh, and, and they both have a lot of respect for each other. According to boxing historian Steve Farhood, this is only the second title fight in Texas between Texas-born fighters. The first being a 118-pound title tilt between Orlando Canizales and Sergio Reyes back in 1994. By the way, Carl's hometown in Milano, population 428. <laughs> Barrio's hometown, San Antonio, population 1.5 million. <laughs> a little bit bigger, just a smidge. Carl is a high volume puncher, but he only lands at 25%. And that's one thing they've been working on, trying to make him more accurate. Carl, the cowboy, um, he's always an exciting uh, fighter. Like you mentioned now, he's always pressuring, mm -hmm. throws a lot, you, he messes a lot, like you mentioned as, as well. But I like what I'm seeing right now. He's not too desperate, he's, he's yes. boxing. He's throwing his jab really well. Um, and, and I'm liking this first round for Carl. Yeah, usually Carl goes from zero to 100 real quick <laughs> real and quick. Uh, relishes the role. But yeah, knowing that this is his first title fight on pay-per-view, opportunities like this do not come all that often. And he's, he's making it Interesting already here in the first round. Well, he's showing composure, which is important for him uh, in this matchup. And landing a nice, some nice work on the inside as well. Goes over the top with yeah. a right hand. Hey, 
Counter left downstairs by Barrios. Both men rely on the jab. Barrios said Virgil Hunter has been talking to him about using that punch a lot in this fight. Beautiful left hand to the body by Barrios. Under a minute remaining in the first frame. Carl coming forward. Perhaps smothering his offense a bit as a referee calls for a break. I see what Butters is doing there at moments. He's letting Carl jump in because he jumps with that jab. So what, what Butters is doing is pulling back and catching him either with that uppercut or right hand. Yeah, Barrios known for being a good infighter because he stood only. Oh, Clint catches Carl with that left hook at range. But Carl tasting the power of Barrios. Barrios grew to 140 where he is now, well, undefeated. At this weight class. And an interesting opening round to this title tussle. Ah. We'll take a look at the uh, keys to victory for these two well, men, starting here, with Barrios. Good job. Uh, you know, I can't. I think he he doesn't want to bend in here. and give Carl a chance to land some of the short uh, counter punches on the inside. Mention the jab. Uh, he and Virgil Hunter have decided he's got to land that punch a lot in this fight, and he has a terrific straight right hand, uh, and that could be a huge weapon for him. For Carl, he sometimes throws uppercuts from way okay. back. That's a no-no tonight. He'll get countered by Barrios if he does it. And he's got to keep his left hand up. And he was already hit with one big right, right. hand in round number one. And for him, also the Close right around. hand is a big weapon. Right, he go. wants to get that punch in. And he did land some good short rights in round one. Oh. Round number two, scheduled for 12 for Mario Barrio secondary 140 okay. pound tilt. And Carl immediately going on the attack. There, Barrios working the body again with his left hook. A nice right by Carl. He's getting that punch, and he's getting it in from mid-range. And there another again. right hand by the challenger, Carl, from mid-range, as you so astutely put it, Allen. He, Carl, always wants to make it a, a firefight, and he's... And referee Babone, though, admonishing Carl for rabbit punches. And it was only one round where, where Cowboy Carl tried to box, tried to be yes. in the outside. Yeah. <laughs> and now we see him where we always see him, which is in the inside. He tried. <laughs> At least he tried. Did not work for him as Barrios is the better fighter in the outside and has a better jab. But I'll tell you what, Carl has found, you know, the question was, could he get to oh. a range? And he's gotten there where he could land some power punches. Chopping right hand wow. by Barrios. Carl just misses with the sweeping right. Carl walking down Barrios. Barrios. Exiting the ropes, attacking the body with the right hand. Oh, holy. Carl's having himself a very nice round, too. Really good round for Carl. And, and that's because Vargas is not throwing that jab. Mm -hmm. He's letting yeah. Carl walk in easily. I mean, I, I, and, and I'm surprised because, I mean, Virgil Hunter, he's really oh, straight with that jab. Counter right. left hook to the body by Barrios. Carlo, Carl proving to be the Texas Tornado, known for his one trade, his work rate, and he's putting the work in. He is following, you know, he, the reason he's landing that right hand, Carl, is because he has established his jab pretty well. Yes. And I see at times that Barrios, instead of wanting to be that jab, a boxer from the outside, he's trying to counter punch a Carl. He's waiting for him to throw that right hand. But there, him. but look at the body shots landed, and that's really the calling card for Barrios, a complete shutout, putting in that investment early. And there, there was that counter right hand. As soon as Carl walked in, he pulled back, and he caught him with that right hand. Counter right hand by Barrios. Another counter left hook by Barrios. So now beginning to time Ryan Carl. You knew this fight had a chance to be a good stylistic matchup, and it is turning out to be that. And again, the counter attack of Barrios coming on strong here in the last half of the second. Hey, now hold it. 
And they're both doing things right. Uh, Carl should be the pressure. He's trying to get inside. But Vargas at the same time, he's being the great boxer. Pull me back. Good job. Protect yourself up top. Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Now listen, he's letting you drop two downstairs, okay? He's letting you drop two underneath at one time, okay? And he's dropping his hands down. So bring the second under, under, over, short hook, short uppercut, okay? Okay. That's there. Now start backing him up some now, okay? Hey, I'm telling you, take your time for boxing. All right. You're jabbing too high. Jab him there. Keep jabbing him there, okay? All right? Come on, give him another drink. Keep the pressure on him, but behind, be smart. Use, use your face, okay? All right, bet. Here you go, Daryl. We are bringing you some big audio dynamite from the corners, thanks to Ronnie Shields and Virgil Hunter, as round three begins here at the Alamo Dome. Two of the very best trainers in the sport of boxing, and uh, they're demonstrating why. Yeah, Hunter, 2011 Trainer of the Year, career-long trainer of retired former two-division champion Andre Ward, and of course, Ronnie Shields has worked with so many great fighters, including the Charlo brothers, on their yeah, way just out. a big win for Jamal Charlo that he just had. This is a 10th fight of Hunter working with Barrios. And there's a lead left hand that drives Carl back. And Carl bouncing up and down. Not really finding stable no, no, footing. No, no, no. Misses wildly with that left. Almost put himself right. through the ropes. <laughs> well, to, true to form, Carl is, is throwing more punches. Uh, 151 so far, but he's only landing at 19%. Barrios landing at 43% according to show stats. Throwing 84 punches, but landing 36. So, uh, you know, th that's kind of true to form for these fighters. Yeah, Carl wants to rope Barrios, doesn't want to rope the ropes as he looks to win his first title. And on the inside, landing yeah. with the right and left, and then Barrios going back downstairs to the body. Some good stuff from both fighters on the inside. Great check hook from Barrios from the distance. He jabs and then he hooks um, again, you know, using the, the whole ring using that ring really well, moving. Uh, whenever Carl takes uh, Varios to the ropes, uh, he, he, he just pivots to the side and he's out of there. It's Floyd Muddy Mayweather in attendance tonight with Gervonta Davis, also known for his uh, check hooks, and they, they cash some big checks over the years. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, when Carl doubles the jab, he's so effective. You know, a couple times he's done that, there it is. And look at how it set up that right hand. I love when they yes. listen to me, Abner. <laughs> right on cue always out. And it's, it's all right. I mean, I mean, we're seeing that. When you jab once, you stay in the air, mm -hmm. and Barrios is there to okay, counterpunch. Still, but if you double throw. jab you, yep. your way inside, you got the right hand, and you, you're, you find your, yourself inside already. Less than a minute remaining in the third round. A valiant effort from Ryan Carl, the 28-year-old, 18-2 and two with 12 knockouts, challenging the 25-year-old Belt holder Barrios, 25 and 0 with 16 knockouts. And in fact, that victory in his last fight, it ended a career high eight fight KO streak when he defeated Akhmedov uh, in somewhat controversial fashion. Some people felt the decision could have gone the other way. Yeah, you could make a strong case for that. Akhmedov fought a very excellent fight. He's a great amateur fighter, and uh, it was a tough win. Hey, this is a fun fight. I am thoroughly enjoying this, and I hope the fans are. It's been a fun night so far. Halloween night at the Alamo Dome. The fans back in attendance, socially distanced, and really enjoying this tear up here in round number three as Carl continues to bring it. Let's go to our boxing historian, Steve Farhood. Well, Mo, we are in the midst, of course, of a, of a devastating pandemic. But if this photo, which is an amazing photo, shows you anything, it's that perhaps nothing ever happens for the first time. This photo is Happened, taken just after World War I in 1919 during the Spanish flu, which, is called, which of course was a devastating pandemic. And it's, a, it's in the Atlantic Ocean on a U.S. naval ship, the USS Saboni. And what's amazing about the photo is you look at the fans, if you look closely, a lot of them are wearing masks, watching this professional boxing match. Of course, social distancing, not so much. 
All of us mask up here, Steve, socially distancing as uh, we happy to have the fans back, but again, need to take the right measures. It is, it is really uncertain, scary times, but uh, we hope you're enjoying tonight's fights because what's not to enjoy? Two stoppages already and the action heating up here in round number four in the first of our two title fights. Oh, nice left hook downstairs to the body. Barrios' money punch is that left hook to the body. And there's that counter punching from Barrios. He waits for, for Carl to throw that jab, and there's that right hand. Or he waits for him to throw a right hand, and there's a body shot as well. So great counter punching from Barrios. Trying to establish that pull counter. And Barrios. Trying to walk down Carl. Carl utilizing his lateral movement walks right into a couple of left hooks. Virgil Hunter told Barrios, you have to push him back son, in this round. That's precisely what he's done. Different attitude in this round from Barrios. And I think he noticed that he hurt him with the body shot. That, that's why he went after him as well. A little more ornery Mario Barrios here in round four. Ryan Carl, a, a true uh, outdoorsman, he goes raccoon hunting. And guess what? I have been raccoon hunting down in Louisiana. You, it's an amazing thing. You shine lights up in the trees and you uh, go after these raccoons. And uh, we were talking about it in our Zoom discussion. I would pay money to see Al yeah. Bernstein raccoon hunting. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that should be a, on pay-per-view. That would be, that's our next pay-per-view show. Carl hunting a different kind of game here in Mario Barrios. And again, at close quarters, Carl misses with the right uppercut left hook. And Barrios again, Abner, just really trying to time the counter. Yeah, great timing from Barrios. I mean, Carl doing everything he can to get in the inside and, and work his own punches. Uh, but again, as Barrios every time turning oh. a Carl, and there's a beautiful right uppercut. uppercut by Mario Barrios. Under a minute remaining here in the fourth. Carl unable to cut off the ring, trying to walk down Barrios, Barrios back foot, and again delivers the stiff jab. And that may have uh, bothered Carl momentarily. Again, those body shots continue okay, stop. to be delivered by Barrios. Carl has been down twice in his career. Barrios has never been knocked down. Great way to change up the punches from Barrios. You go upstairs, you check hook, and next thing you know, you're just not expecting a body shot, and he lands a body shot. Right hand by Barrios. We're through four. Five. Mario Barrios had an excellent round, probably his best round of the fight as he fends off that right hand from Carl, but he, he he's going to land a nice right hand and uh, over the lazy left of Ryan Carl. Later on in the round, working that with that left downstairs, that one actually ended up being an uppercut, as did that. But he, the left hook has been a big weapon for him now, and that really, that's a triple hook when you get right down to it. And still trying to get that right hand in as well. And, you know, normally... You don't try. He tries to throw the right uppercut from too far out, realizes his mistake, and says, OK, I'll just land a jab, right? <laughs> yes, it is a combination of punches. He goes upstairs, downstairs, like I mentioned. He changes it up. Yep, making those on-the-fly adjustments. Where do you have a man who holds what? a belt as Mario Barrios and Ryan Carl renew hostilities here in the fifth round? This is an important part of this fight for Ryan Carl. He he needs to do something here to get himself back into this like he was in round three. Barrios starting to show, kind of separate out a little bit from him. Carl okay, has stop, Barrios stop. on the ropes trying to work the body before being separated by the referee. There's Carl going downstairs. He's done very little body work in this, and in this fight. Yeah, and it's... 
he's he's below average in terms of the statistics and you can see the wide punches uh, Abner. Yeah, uh, and, and great job from Varios. When Carlos finds himself in the inside, what Varios does really well is that he, he goes really close into Carlos' body, and which makes him miss those body shots that Al was mentioning. And He's good not punch. able to land. Yeah, good punch oh, yeah. placement by Varios going downstairs while Carl looks to respond upstairs. Eats another jab from Varios. There's a right hand by Carl. When he gets in that little mid-range spot, he can land those those right hands. And again, there, Carl uses the jab to pave his way in. Barrios and, and that's up on the right. And Barrios has very much targeted the body. And you make those early dividends, hoping to reap the rewards the deeper the fight goes. Landing a little bit more in this round, Carl the Cowboy. But if he were to close the ring a little bit, uh, I think he would be more effective. He hasn't done that yet. He's just following Barrios all over the ring. Carl's corner calling for the right hand. Instead, it's Barrios going to the body and then a left uppercut as they oh, break holy. apart. And Carl goes over top with the right hand. Less than a minute left here in the fifth. Left hook lands, lead left hook for Barrios. I think the one of the big uh, headlines of this fight has been the body work of Barrios, landing 30 body punches so far to only several by Carl, according to show stats, and that's been a big difference. And there's now 30 seconds left here in the fifth round. Carl leads with the jab, but gets countered again by Barrios. And Abner, the corner calling for Carl's right hand. Easier said than done as he's yes. now get picked off with that left hook. What's uh, what's one path to potential success for that right? Double jab. You got to double jab your way in, and he hasn't done it in a while. Look like they're getting weaker, are they? Yeah. Okay. When you have him at a disadvantage when he's on the rope, start closing the distance on him now, okay? Start putting the punches together. Now listen, quit turning your head away when you're on the inside, okay? When you're losing sight of him because he's trying to come behind over the top, okay? Yeah. So quit turning the head away from him, okay? You got me? Yeah. Okay, stay focused now. Yeah. Where's my right now I'm looking for it, okay? okay? I need that right uppercut now, all right? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Now look, you got to keep the pressure on this guy now. We got to put more pressure on him, okay? okay? Make him fight now. Here, Dale, take this. No pressure, no diamonds, no title for Ryan Carls. He comes out on the attack to begin round number six, and now it's Barrios upstairs with a jab, and Barrios putting together some thudding punches downstairs and upstairs on Carl. And you know, I said in the keys, don't throw uppercuts to Carl because sometimes he throws some. Oh, 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 and that right hand oh. dropped him to a knee. Three, four, five, six. Oh. Seven, eight. Are you all right? You want? Do you want to continue? Yeah, for sure. One hundred percent. Both. Ryan Carl down for the third time in his career here in round number six. Barrios putting the pedal to the metal. Carl guess, doing a veteran don't, move, don't, don't, tying no, up no, the no, champion, no, 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 trying to buy himself some time. Ronnie Shields was yelling from the corner for him to hold, and he did that. He did just that. But how long can that last? Yeah, how long can he hold back? The Barrios Barrage. Gutsy warrior, Ryan Carl. Oh, yeah. And he's still occasionally getting those little short right hands in, and they want... Oh, oh that right hand! Yeah. But Barrios took it, Abner, and just didn't even flinch. Oh, there's a cut. A bad cut. Clash of heads. And the referee calls it a clash of heads. So now, the Crimson Mask and... Bloodying up Ryan Carl. 
What would Halloween night be without a little plasma? <laughs> and Ryan Carl, though, can't seem to find his balance, but keeps coming forward. Oh. He's landing Another some right hand, hands. yes! What a bad break for Carl that that clash of head ha clash happened hey, right there no. and he got cut because that he was gaining same. some momentum in this fight. Yeah, literally a blood and guts battle Not so sorry. far. Mm. Boy. He can go ahead for a little bit. Referee going to allow Ryan Carl to continue. A minute left here in the sixth stanza. Barrios, Carl still trying to counter, but now dropping down. He's backed up along the ropes, valiantly trying to fight back. Eats an uppercut. Barrios trying to tee off on Carl, you know, but Carl's like an extra from the Walking Dead. What a bad break for uh, Ryan Carl, who, who at that moment was fighting his way back into the fight, and they, the clash of heads created that awful cut, and that was simply more than he could cope with. And of course, as he leaves this ring, they'll be dealing with that medically uh, as soon as they can. But. It, it, it was just a, a very bad circumstance for him. And the intriguing thing is that was becoming a very exciting round because Carl found the home for a couple of really good right hands. And it's just unfortunate for him that that clash of heads created such problems for him. And then Barrios, of course, landed some big punches. Hey, he's a smiling warrior. He's and, and what a brave effort by him. What a heart. I mean, even you mentioned it, even when he was taking some shots, he was giving those right hands yeah. right back. He was not giving up at all. Cowboy's so tough. Yeah, Cowboy Country's uh, grown by a few new followers, I'm sure. Valiant effort by Ryan Carl. I'm sure all 428 residents of Milano are proud of Ryan Carl, despite the fact that he does not take the title back with him. We'll take a look at how uh, Mario Barrios created the, the knockdown. It was a beautiful straight right hand over the uh, kind of a, a left hand that was languishing out there by Carl. And that, Carl was in trouble from that. There's no question about that. And look how he caught that jab and then he countered with that mm -hmm. right hand. That's, that's definitely a Virgil Hunter of move. But then Ryan Carl was able to make some things happen to fight, to try and keep himself in this fight. He, he takes the right hand by Barrios, and that hurt him for sure. That's well, that's the uh, again he's he's down from that right hand, and that's where Ryan Carl was in some problems, obviously. And he would have to fight his way through that. 
and then he would get to the point where he would uh, do some good things on his own. Now, this, we're going to see the short right hands there. Well, there's the clash of heads. That right after Carl had done what he just did there, which is throw a really good right hand, the gruesome cut from the clash of heads. And it came right after Carl had done some good things in this match, but that clash of heads was, you know, created a just an atrocious cut. And then ultimately, uh, this left hook would send him down. Well, left hand's landing there, and he's still fighting back. And then that left hook is the one that actually sent him down to the canvas. And uh, this fight was was called at that point. You know, that, that was as much due to the clash of heads, I think, as the punches uh, from Barrios. But make no mistake, Barrios certainly did some good work there. And he's a happy man. He keeps that secondary title and looks ahead in the 140-pound division. Let's go up to Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time of two minutes, 23 seconds in round number six. He is the winner by way of knockout. He is still undefeated and still the WBA super lightweight champion of the world, Mario El Azteca. The 25-year-old Mario Barrios pushes his record to 26 and 0, uh, gets his 17th stoppage as a professional fighter, and uh, did did so in fine fashion in in a fight that was competitive in spots because of Ryan Carl's toughness and because Carl was able to put some good things together offensively in that fight and in a way fought a level above where he was uh, after but yes. just couldn't quite get to, to the Can final Can I say something? Um, Mario Bra uh, Barrios, the, the way he, he, he finished that fight, it was just uh, fantastic. I mean, he, he, he became, he fought from a distance. The way he just closed it, the way he kept at a distance and landed those shots. And we look at the numbers and you see the 51% of the power shots landed by Barrios. He is a more accurate puncher in general, as we said, than Carl. And it really was true for him. Carl landing about 18% uh, of his punches, Barrios at 43, which is very impressive. So that's kind of where their form is. And that is what Barrios did in this fight. And um, a, a game, Brian Carl couldn't quite match the technique and the skill of Mario Barrios. We'll take a peek back at the, the knockdown that started all the problems for Ryan Carl. And it, it'll come from this right hand that over the uh, very low left of uh, Carl. And that was where things started to go south for Ryan Carl. Even though we had a mini comeback after that, the clash of heads would further exacerbate his problems in this fight and uh, lead ultimately to the to the stoppage of this. And then we'll look at the end of this match when already there had been that terrible gash from the clash of heads. Barrios landing an uppercut on the inside and ultimately would get in a couple of left hooks here. The uppercut and then another left hook would do him in, Evan. That, that um, uppercut kind of reminded me of the fight when Juan Manuel Marquez dropped uh, uh, Juan Baby Bull Diaz. Uh, he Very stepped, good, yeah. Yes, he stepped to his side in beautiful uppercuts. Good analogy. Uh, and so for Ryan Carl, that would spell the end of this matchup, and uh, he won a lot of hearts here tonight uh, with his courage and his grit, that's for sure. And never, it's, in a, never in a boring fight. <laughs> that's for sure. And with Mario Barrios, we've got Mo Ranallo. Let's go to Mauro right now. Thank you very much, Al. Mario, congratulations. Uh, your first title defense in front of an actual crowd here in your hometown of San Antonio. Talk about what it means to have your first title defense here at the Alamo Dome. Hey, everybody here in San Antonio, man, at the Alamo Dome right now, this was for y'all. I promise you guys I was going to have my uh, defense here eventually. Yo, we got it right away. The first one with the audience. I hope everybody enjoyed. Thank everybody that I showed up today, everybody that, that bought the paper. Hat off to your opponent, Ryan Carl. Talk about his toughness tonight. 
Roberts. I mean, I've known Ryan for a long time. Right? A real good friend of mine. I, I mean, from I'm still supporting him and everything. I knew he was going to come hard, but I knew that was his only chance, was to come with everything. So I was in there. I was being patient. I was picking my shots. And then, I mean, I, I, I started to really land them. And, I mean, I, I got him out of there. As usual, you made the investment to the body. You found success with the right hand. And then that check left hook to finish it. Uh, how do you assess your performance tonight? I mean, uh, like I said, I, kn I knew he was going to come out hard. I was being patient there. I was ready to go hard 12 rounds. But, I mean, I, I got him out of there early. I mean, picking my shots, being patient, listening to my coach, Virgil Hunter. And, I mean, we, we came here and got that job done in front of everybody here at home. What is it like to have someone like Virgil Hunter in your corner? What has he meant to your career over these past 10 fights? Uh, Virgil has meant a lot to me, man. Me and him, we have a great relationship. He's more than just a coach to me. He's a mentor. He's like family to me. I'm very thankful for the relationship that me and Virgil had developed. I know what you've done for your city and your community during the pandemic, and I want to one more time say congratulations. Your first successful title defense here in San Antonio in front of a live audience. Let's hear it for Mario Barrios. Oh, I want to take a minute, though. This fight I dedicate to my good friends, Travel Mazion and Darrell Godley. Last time I saw Javel was when he fought here. So it was real emotional. Darrell, too, man, he was a real good friend of mine. Passed away late summer. But, man, this fight was for them. This fight was for all my family, for Dia de los Muertos, and for all my ancestors. May they rest in peace. Congratulations again, Mario. Thank you. Let's go back to ringside. Thank you, Mo. Well, a, uh, a very big moment for Mario Barros, basking in the uh, adoration of this crowd. And we go inside the ropes to see just how he did it in this um, gritty battle with Ryan Carl. We go inside, we go inside with the ropes with Barrios, uh, showing us during the course of this fight what he has to offer. The, the right hand getting in on a regular basis, and though Ryan Carl kept trying to get in offensively, that right hand of Barrios is a big one. And there, a fascinating um, adjustment when he tries to throw that uppercut from the outside, realizes it's a mistake, comes back with the jab. And then finally, th this is where things started to go really south for Ryan Carl. The right hand would knock him down. And then after a clash of heads that created that terrible cut, these couple left hooks would send Carl down and end this fight. And from Barrio Barrios, quite a win. Let's bring in Steve Farhood. Yes, Al, the uh, scores at the time of the stoppage, perhaps a little bit closer than you might have thought with Barrios winning uh, 49-46 on two cards and 48-47 on the third. You look at my card, I had it 49-46 as well. I gave Carl the third round, but you always had the impression that Barrios was landing big shots and hurting Carl with almost every big shot every round, even though the knockdown didn't come until round five. And once again, the judges scores closer than you might have thought, but clearly Barrios left no question about who the better fighter was. Let's send things back to Brian Custer. Okay, Al, congratulations to the champ, Mario Barrios. It's got to be special for him to defend your title right here in your hometown of San Antonio. What a night we've had. Three fights, three knockouts. We got the opportunity to capture some audio from two of the best trainers in boxing, in Virgil Hunter and Ronnie Shields. We call it trainer tracks. Take your time, don't be in a rush. You got 12 rounds, okay? Yeah. Box, don't run in. When, it, when you break it, step to it real quick with a one, two, okay? Because he's lackadaisical. Jab the chest, okay? That chest ain't going nowhere. Yeah. Then when you get close, sometimes shoot that right hand to the body, then bring your hook back up top. You got to break this guy down, okay? But in order to break him down, we got to go to the body. Good job. You started to really hurt him to the body. He can't take that. He can't take that. Come on, I need you to hurt this guy with something right now, yeah. okay? Straight. Stop head hunting, okay? Jab here. Keep hitting that body. The jab is clicking. He's got to deal with that jab so the body is open. His punches look like they're getting weaker, are they? Yeah. Okay. Okay, stay focused now. Yeah. Now I need you to be a champion now. I need you to be a champion now, okay?
That's how you fight a wild man. Yeah. Well, you, because you haven't seen that style before, so you have to take your time and find out what he's doing. You slowly broke him down. The body shots were beautiful. And like I said, this time, it? Virgil Hunter with really some insightful information there. You know, coming up next, it is the main event of the evening. Gervonta Tank Davis squaring off with Leo Santa Cruz. This is the biggest fight of their lives. And for both fighters, it's the rare matchup of titles, two divisions up for grab, the WBA lightweight and super featherweight belts. There's that pride that we have. We come to fight. We come to leave everything in the ring. I'm here for a reason. I'm made for this. The only person that can break me is myself. thinking he's just gonna come at me. I don't think that he's that crazy. When they talk about Mexican fighters, they're warriors. They come to fight. They come to leave everything in the ring. It no matter if you can have a big ass car like this, you're not gonna give up. You're gonna fight no matter what. Oh, 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 oh. Davis always looking to close the show in spectacular fashion. I'm way stronger, way faster. When it's time to handle business, then turn to a monster. I want Gervonta Davis in 2020. We're gonna make that fight happen. And I'm gonna show the world that I'm not scared of nobody. Would you like to fight possibly Leo Santa Cruz? If you see, I have the WBA and I got the IBF. Uh, so let's get it on. To all action warriors, it's been another blood and guts battle. Hank's a great fighter. He's talented, strong, but I'm better. And it's Davis emptying the fuselage. Goes down. It's gonna be a big fight. Probably one of the best fights that's happened in 2020. Of course, this is showtime, because it's always showtime. It's always lights, camera, action. You know, Leo Santa Cruz told me his game plan to be smart. Move around the ring, frustrate Tank Davis, make Gervonta throw big shots and miss, which Leo believes will eventually wear Tank down. Leo says he has to fight on the outside and throw the one-two all night long. Leo also believes the second half of the fight is where he has to dominate and is successful. He says he'll shock the world. Gervonta. Well, he says he's going to take the first round, maybe two, just to see how Leo's going to fight him. But he wants to show everyone he's not just a big puncher, but he can box as well. Tank says body shots will be key to slowing Leo down, and, and he won't hesitate to hold if he gets a little fatigue. Tank says it's imperative that he hurts Santa Cruz with power shots, specifically his uppercut when he gets Leo against the ropes. He believes this fight will be all about who can dish it out, but more importantly, who can take it. It's our main event, and it's straight ahead. As you see Tank Davis there warming up with his trainer, Calvin Ford here. And you know, here's the interesting thing about this fight. You know, Tank is all about showing people, hey, look, I can box too. I haven't had the opportunity to do that yet. And I think this is a fight where I can show off those skills. And for Leo Santa Cruz, I thought one thing that was interesting that he told me was that, listen, I am going to use the ring, use my length, box. But he said, you know, sometimes when you're fighting a bully, you got to punch him in the mouth and get your respect. So at times, I'm going to have to step to Gervonta Davis to let him know that I, too, have some power and to keep him off of me. That's why they call it the sweet science, to see how both of these guys are going to fight in what they call the biggest fight of their career. Both of them have always talked about being here on pay-per-view. They've achieved that goal, and now both of them want this to become a regular event for them. The only way that's going to happen, you got to be victorious in the first one. It should be one heck of a main event. We are about 
five minutes away from the main event. Let's go back ringside tomorrow. All right, BC, thank you very much. Unique environment to be sure in one of the, well, most unique years any of us have ever experienced. Tonight at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas, about to play host for another historic matchup, as we mentioned, just the third time in nearly a century that two titles in two different weight divisions up for grabs. And of course, you have two fighters who are both headlining their first pay-per-views. And for Gervonta Davis, perhaps he thought destiny would bring him here. He has Floyd Money Mayweather, Mr. Pay-per-view guiding his career. For Leo Santa Cruz, already has accomplished so much. The only fighter in history to win titles at 118, 122, 126, and now 130 pounds. He's all action, but he has also heard the so-called internet trolls, those who criticized Leo Santa Cruz, saying that he wasn't up for the big fights. What, you forget the, the two fights with Abner Marez, the two fights with Carl Frampton? Well, he went out and called out one of the biggest punchers pound for pound in the sport in Gervonta Davis. And yes, for Davis tonight, it's a about proving that he is another major pay-per-view star. Let's bring in Steve Farwood. Mo, if you go back to 1931 and 1933, two of the greatest fighters in history, Hall of Famers Kid Chocolate and Tony Canzanari, fought about eight fights in which more than one title, more than one division title was at stake. Then you have to fast forward 55 years to Ray Leonard, Don Lalonde, when Leonard became a five division champion by winning two titles, 168 and 175. And then again, a few years after that, Mayweather and Maidana. So if you're at Davis and Santa Cruz fighting for belts in two different divisions, and the company you're keeping is Floyd Mayweather, Sugar Ray Leonard, Kid Chocolate, and Tony Canzanari, <laughs> I'd say that's a list you'd like to be on. It has been a quick night, plenty of fistic fireworks, and let's uh, recap the three fights that have just taken place, all three ending in the distance. And uh, Al, it began with a bang, courtesy of Isak Cruz. The 22-year-old Cruz came out smoking, and Diego Magdaleno, the 34-year-old veteran, just had no answers for him. That all happened in the opening moments of the fight. And then Cruz just continued to rip these uppercuts. And this one would really just shake up Diego Magdaleno. And this is when he went down a second time and this fight would be stopped. Thankfully, Magdaleno was okay. It was a tremendous win for the 22 year old and he shows why he could be a player in the lightweight division there was no hand of god for the fighter named after diego maradona on this uh -huh. night regis progre halloween night rougarou his wife expecting their third child at any time while well, he fought like a guy who needed to be someplace else he did indeed eraldez was uh stepping up in class and Abner he couldn't quite make it uh, to where Regis Progre was. He could and uh, Progre was just fighting so great great distance moving perfectly as a softball and, and and definitely you know did a lot of uh, damage and came out victorious this this and this fight I would like to see a fight between him and, and Barrios. <laughs> Speaking of Barrios, nice segue Mr. Matas you're learning here broadcast 101 we've got Marcos we got Mario Barrios here against Ryan Carl, the Cowboy. Barrios in his maiden voyage as a secondary 140-pound champion, fighting in front of his hometown fans here in San Antonio. And boy, put on a brilliant effort against a gutsy Ryan Carl. And this is one of those cases where, we, of course, as we've said, first time fans there and many of Barrios's fans here in this arena, you could hear them even so, though they're distanced in a very large building and a very special moment for him. And you matchmaker Abner Matas would love to see Barrios <laughs> go one on one with Regis Progre. We are now just moments away from our main event. Gervonta Davis defending the 135 pound title against Leo Santa Cruz and his 
his newly minted 130 pound belt to the victor go all the spoils a signature victory the gateway to elite status awaits Gervonta Davis or Leo Santa Cruz with more let's go back to BC well Mo a little over 9,000 people have come here into the Alamo Dome to witness this. You know, this is the first major boxing event with fans. Of course, all of them socially distanced here, but a little over 9,000 have come in here. You know, Showtime has had such a storied history in this building. You can go back to 1993 when 65,000 came in here to see Chavez and Pernell Whitaker. Oh, 40,000 came here to see Canelo and Trout in 2013. So start showtime again storied history here looking to write another chapter here tonight with this main event because again the main event here over 9000 inside this building. Let's reset here. Uh, of course our lineup here. I'm Brian Custer with you Mo Ranallo giving you all the blow by blow. You've got the Hall of Famer Al Bernstein four time champion You've got Abner Morris here as well. Steve Farhood he's our boxing historian all of those all of those people uh, here to bring you this main event and that main event is coming up next. Davis versus Santa Cruz is being brought to you by Showtime pay-per-view by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. And by proper number 12 Irish whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world. This is the current Irish whiskey belt holder. This is the rich and smooth challenger. Ding, ding. Proper number 12, Irish whiskey, one for all. We've had three fights, three knockouts. It's time for the main event. Davis, Santa Cruz, Mo, let's get it. All right, BC, let's get it. Indeed, main event time, Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas. Gervonta Davis, the 135-pound belt holder whose 957 knockout percentage is second highest of all Ring Magazine ranked fighters behind light heavyweight champ Arter Beterbiev. He passed his first test on the scale and now faces a different kind of test in Santa Cruz thought to be the physically smaller of the two, but he showed off added muscle when he weighed in for the biggest opportunity of his career. These two warriors who have overcome an abundance of adver adversity out of the ring are about to encounter what is supposed to be their biggest form of adversity inside the ropes, each other. Here's Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, as we approach the main event, we extend a special welcome to the brave men and women serving around the world and joining us tonight on AFN, the American Forces Network. All right, fans, the time has come for the bout you've all been waiting for, the featured attraction of the evening, champion versus champion for the super featherweight and lightweight championship of the world. And now making his way to the ring, the distinguished world champion fighting out of Los Angeles and representing his heritage of Michoacan in Mexico. He is the four division world champion. He is the current WBA featherweight and super featherweight champion of the world, Leo El Terremoto.
being led to the ring by the king of Corrido, Martin Castillo. Leo Santa Cruz's father worked two jobs and still found the time to take his boys to the gym, where he hoped his passion for boxing would translate into titles for his progeny. Leo, who started training at the age of eight, would make his father's dream come true. Now, when Santa Cruz said he wanted to challenge Davis, only one person in his inner circle thought it was a good idea. You guessed it, his dad. And his dad, who has had to overcome near-death experiences with cancer and COVID, is here tonight. And he feels the boxing strategy his son employed in avenging the only loss of his career to Frampton is the path to victory tonight. An incredibly poignant scene, not only is Jose Santa Cruz, we were told that he may not be able to make it into the ring. He is standing by his son. An incredible, an incredible scene. It is so great to see Leo Santa Cruz in this position. His first pay-per-view fight, I mean, is coming from a guy that fought him twice. And, you know, he gets, he hasn't been getting respect, you know, the respect that he should be getting. Uh, the guy is not just a volume puncher. He's an all-around great fighter. Uh, you know, when he stays uh, disciplined with the jab, with the distance, he is, he is a great boxer. And I just hope that he can do that against Tank Davis, at least early on in the fight. And then, you know the experience is going to kick in and then he'll know when to go in and go full force against Hank Davis. The biggest treat Santa Cruz could give his hometown of Los Angeles is its third championship of the month after the Lakers won their record tying 17th NBA title and earlier this week the Dodgers secured their first MLB crown in 32 years. And now, ladies and gentlemen, joining us to the blue corner, the young star of boxing from Baltimore, Maryland. He is the three-time two-division champion of the world. He is the current undefeated and reigning WBA lightweight champion of the world, Gervonta Tank Davis.
DJ Tank Davis has certainly been embraced by the hip hop community, including superstar rapper Lil Uzi Vert, and all the ingredients have been put in place for Tank Davis to become a legitimate boxing star. He's proven to be a bona fide ticket seller, and now in Leo Santa Cruz has the kind of dance partner who could legitimize his status, who wants to follow in the footsteps of his promoter Floyd Money Mayweather. Now, Money Mayweather began his big money pay-per-view runs by facing Oscar De La Hoya. He was dressed in a sombrero. I don't know if it was as respectful as is intended tonight. As you see, Mayweather, I think Gervonta Davis showing some respect for the Mexican audience in attendance as he hopes to launch his pay-per-view career success. And that's been a calling card of both these fighters for this fight. I mentioned it earlier on the broadcast. They've shown respect for each other. They've called out, they've called attention to the strengths of their opponent not creating a silly feud. And, you know, he went out to Las Vegas, as you pointed out earlier, trained with Flo in Floyd Mayweather's gym. He and Calvin Ford felt that it was a perfect fit, and they think that preparation will lead them to uh, a victory here tonight. And we'll look at the numbers for these two fighters. And uh, one of the most important things, they're not huge edges, but the height and reach for Leo Santa Cruz, he believes they're going to have to be his ticket to a win in this fight. And after uh, alluded to it, he's got to fight tall, and he's got to use that height and reach. And the rules for the main event, there is no standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Only the referee can stop the fight. A fighter cannot be saved by the bell in any round. If an accidental foul or headbutt causes a fight to end within four rounds, it's a no decision. After four rounds, they go to the scorecards for a technical decision. It's all Hallows Eve. It's a showdown in the Lone Star State here at the Alamo Dome. It's time once again for Jimmy Lennon. Junior! Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Alamo Dome here in the beautiful city of San Antonio, Texas, as Premier Boxing Champions presents the featured bout of the evening, brought to you by Mayweather Promotions. TGB Promotions, GTD Promotions, Santa Cruz Boxing Club, and Showtime. Sponsored by proper number 12 Irish Whiskey, the finest, the tastiest, the smoothest liquid gold in the world, and O'Reilly Auto Parts. Order your parts online at O'ReillyAuto.com and get free curbside pickup. This bound in the ring is sanctioned by the WBA, the President Gilberto Jesus Mendoza, the Supervisor Julio Time, along with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulations. The Executive Director is Brian Francis. Introducing our three judges scoring from ringside. From Connecticut, Glenn Feldman. From California, Alejandro Ruchin. And from Oklahoma, David Sutherland. Introducing our referee in charge, he will be giving instructions after the introductions, Rafael Ramos. All right, fans, here we go with the main event of the evening, 12 rounds of boxing for the WBA Super Featherweight and WBA Lightweight Championship of the World. And now, ladies and gentlemen in attendance and boxing fans joining us around the world, Live from San Antonio, Texas, it's showtime! <laughs> Introducing to you first on my right, the lightweight world champion fighting out of the blue corner, entering the ring wearing white trunks with red and green trim, hailing from and representing his home of Baltimore, Maryland. He weighed in at a ready 129 and three quarter pounds with a sensational record of 23 wins, no losses. He has 22 big wins coming by way of knockout. Formerly boxing's youngest world champion, he is the popular and acclaimed three-time two-division world champion. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the hard-hitting, current, reigning and defending, undefeated WBA lightweight champion of the world, introducing Gervonta Tank Davis. And his 
his opponent across the ring, the super featherweight world champion fighting out of the red corner, entering the ring wearing black trunks with multi-color trim from Los Angeles, California, and representing his heritage of Wetamo, Michoacan, Mexico. He weighed in at 129 and one half pounds, having faced seven world champions in his illustrious career. His record stands at 37 wins, one loss, one draw, with 19 wins coming by way of knockout. Tonight, in his 18th world title appearance, here is the renowned four division world champion, the current WBA featherweight world champion, and the current reigning and defending WBA super featherweight champion of the world, introducing Rafael Ramos. Davis. You received the pre-fight instructions. Recibiste las instrucciones. Protect yourself. Protégete todo el tiempo. Give me a clean fight. Una pelea limpia. Buena suerte. Good luck. Good luck. Referee Rafael Ramos, 30 years experience, his 483rd pro bout, both Santa Cruz and Davis, a combined 23 and 1 in major title fights. Santa Cruz usually throws punches like internet throws, throw shade. He wanted to silence his critics, and he just called out one of the biggest punchers in Gervonta Davis. There's a reason. Davis is Mike Tyson's favorite fighter. And this is round number one, the 130 pound belt holder, Santa Cruz, in black. Black, green, orange, and gold. The 135-pound belt holder, Gervonta Davis, in the red, white, and green. And there's a counter, left uppercut by Davis. So much as Al Santa Cruz wants to establish the jab. Yes, he does. He, you know, he lands, he throws 33 jabs per round normally, lands seven. Whether he'll be as much of a volume puncher in this match early remains to be seen. Abner, you've been in the ring twice with Santa Cruz. You trained to face Davis. What are you picking up early on? I like how Santa Cruz is trying to stay disciplined with that jab. He's trying to work uh, his jab and move backwards a bit. He's got to turn Davis, though, to his left um, and not extend the jab because when, when he does that, I already saw early on that Davis counter punches with that left. Yeah, that left uppercut has, has been there. Santa Cruz goes upstairs. You know, the, the combination punching of Santa Ooh. Cruz can push Davis back, and that would be interesting to see. Davis doesn't normally fight going backwards. Again, Davis winding up with that left uppercut. Already blood on the face of Leo Santa Cruz. Bridge of his nose, it looks like. There's a right hand, a right hook behind the guard. Santa Cruz comes back with a right bounced off Davis' glove. Well, this fight is starting out the way Davis wants it to. He wants it to be this kind of give and take. And it's kind of interesting because I would think the other way. I would think that Davis will be the fighter that would want to be in the outside, pick his punches, but no, he's the pressure fight. He's the pressure fighter in this fight. He's pressuring the, the, so the bully that Santa Cruz is used to being the put bully, pushing a, a fighter back. But now we see Davis picking his punches as Santa Cruz at moments, he, he, he does land also. Davis off to a quick start, of course, apparently made weight fairly easily. Maybe confident about going into deep waters. Remember, Santa Cruz said that Davis is dangerous for the first six rounds and then begins to fade. That's where Santa Cruz wants to bring Davis is into the deeper waters as they exchange Davis. Push down, referee rules it. No knockdown. And the just over 9,000 fans in attendance, if the introductions were any indication, all the fans might be cheering on both fighters. Great start here, round number one. An electric atmosphere at the Alamo Dome. 
Hey, chinito, tú, tú, tú siempre te como, como tú quieras, ¿ok? No te vamos a decir como tú vas a ver cómo pelea la dentro, ¿ok, chinito? Hey, ya, está, ya se está cansando. This was not a knockdown, but instead a slip. It came at a time when Santa Cruz was being aggressive. You can't fight him on the inside. Now there was a jab that landed and a right hand, kind of off the top of their feet. But it was their feet that created the going down for Davis. So not called a knockdown. And another look at it will demonstrate that it was their feet that kind of got wrapped up with each other, even though Santa Cruz was pushing forward. An appropriate call on that in what was a very interesting round one. The bell and round number two. Davis has never been down as a pro. Leo Santa Cruz officially down once, but the referee actually apologized to him after for missing the fact that the punch was a rabbit punch. Santa Cruz delivering the jab, trying to split the guard, leads with the right hand, putting pressure on Davis early in round two. Intriguing. You know, already Leo Santa Cruz, you can get the feeling he thinks he can push Davis back in this fight. Will that be the proper move for him? He's landing some nice punches. Well, Abner, the narrative coming in was that Santa Cruz was the, the smaller guy. We saw it the way in. He had added muscle, and, and that does not seem to be the case against definitely a more compact, harder puncher. But Santa Cruz is not the smaller guy in this yes. fight. Well, listen, the only reason we said that Santa Cruz, a lot of people would want Santa Cruz to box in the first couple of rounds is because we know David Carey yeah. carries a big punch and we it, it's almost like in the first couple of rounds but it but it but that's the game plan you want to push a Davis back he doesn't know how to fight backwards Davis turns 26 next Saturday Santa Cruz turned 32 in August so the youth is on the side of Davis misses just misses with that counter left uppercut that has yeah. been there for him yeah, you feel that's going to be an important weapon for Davis. He he want, He's trying very hard to get it in. He has to be careful throwing it from too far out. He was countered by uh, Santa Cruz. Just past the midpoint of round two. A compelling confrontation. And already so much to absorb. Oh, but Davis, there goes the sportsmanship. Okay, you okay? Don't do that. Okay, let's go. We talked about Davis perhaps maturing. He's had his issues outside of the ring. And, and Al, you mentioned it at the top of the show. The fact that there was so much respect heading into the showdown. Well, Davis <laughs> temper getting the better of him there. You can forget about that now. And there's some frustration on his part. And that's not always a good thing for a fighter. No. If you get frustrated, you start draining yourself also mentally. And, um, you know, Santa Cruz doing a fantastic job in this second round. And Davis leaving the distractions of his life in Baltimore. Spent 15 weeks in Las Vegas at the Mayweather Boxing Gym. Said that he would like to hold all of his camps there because of the lack of distractions and the ability to focus. But Santa Cruz now unloading on Davis. Davis rolling with some of those shots and avoiding the right hand. Santa Cruz putting on pressure. It's a combination punch of Santa Cruz. When he is at his best, those combinations oh. flow, but there's that left Counter. uppercut from Davis. Davis timing that left uppercut counter. Good stuff through two rounds. Well, if round one was intriguing, round two was exciting. Uh, and this, again, would be going to the canvas, but not for a punch. That was, in, you know, pretty blatant throwdown. Now, he's claiming that he was being held, I guess, behind the head. But uh, whatever the case, it was chippy. And this is where Santa Cruz had pushed Davis back and was landing some shots. Not getting everything in there, but throwing combinations and trying to push Davis against the ropes. His mission to back Davis up, which is not the normal posture for Gervonta um, Davis. The Marcus of Queensbury was not pleased. <laughs> no. <laughs> Slow everything down. Slow everything down, Tank here.
This is round number three, scheduled for 12. Both belts on the line. Davis 135 pound title, Santa Cruz 130 pound strap. I like what I'm seeing from Leo. He's not throwing wide punches. Uh, he's throwing straight punches, which is making Davis pull right back. And he catches uh, Tank Davis with those punches. It's making Santa Cruz staying at a distance, which is good on his end. You get the feeling Davis is his adapting so far to being pushed back is that he's going to want to try to land that counter left hand a, a big power punch and that's the thing that Santa Cruz has to really be careful of because Davis can land that shot and hurt you. Santa Cruz wants to keep Davis corralled in the there corner but there's a counter left from Davis allows him to escape. Santa Cruz taking small steps and there's a left hook again the left hand missed with the right uppercut. And of course, anything either Santa Cruz or Davis throws, and this is the first time during the pandemic, you know the crowd is going yeah. to react. And again, Davis getting physical. Davis also mentioned, of course, working with Floyd Mayweather, he wanted to showcase his ring IQ. He wanted to showcase his, his boxing technique. It was the estimable Emmanuel Stewart who said knockout sell, and knockouts have been Davis' calling card. But he's going to have to dig down deep into those tricks here on Halloween to try to solve a guy who's been a champion in four different weight classes. Davis starting to use the jab, and he has a good jab. It's an underused punch sometimes for him, but it is effective. As Santa Cruz's Twitch signed up for a Twitch account yet. Inquiring minds want to know. Left hook by Santa Cruz. Another left hand upstairs. Well, this is a fight being fought right in the pocket. And that may be a surprise to some people because we thought Santa Cruz was going to have a little more movement. But it's a pocket fight, and that's going to make it a good fight for the fans. It's in Santa Cruz innate nature. He loves to pump up the volume, and there again, Davis comes back with a couple of left hands, goes to the body. And look at the difference. When Davis is the aggressor, uh, you see a to totally different fight going towards Davis. So Santa Cruz has to keep uh, Davis out of that reach with that jab and push him back. A lot of nervous energy from Santa Cruz. Davis seems, other than that momentary lapse in judgment when he threw Santa Cruz to the ground, seems focused. Seems measured. Final 10 seconds of the third. Both fighters headlining their first pay-per-view here tonight. Davis versus Santa Cruz. And Mayweather, Money Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather headlines 16 pay-per-views. Let's listen in. Trying to deliver some instructions. Calm down, bro. Right here. Take it. Man, Tank, look, don't pull back. That's how he catch you here. And remember, when he throw the brick, the one is coming on the other side here, all right? And it's nothing wrong you getting close to him here. And keep your hands up in the inside. You good, babe. Just take deep breaths. Take deep breaths. We good. We excellent. Hey. Aguántale, aguanta ahorita hasta los, hasta los cinco, los seis. De ahí te, de, de, de ahí te, de ahí te, de ahí, de ahí, de ahí ya estás cansando. Aguántale, chico. Bajo, bajo. So we've already seen Gervonta Davis advance counter punching ability. And now here, beginning of round four, Leo Santa Cruz double and triple pumping with the jab. Davis uh, averages only 39 punches per round. He's very economical in his punches compared, of course, to Santa Cruz, who we've said sometimes throws upwards of 80, averages 85. But it's the, it's the ability to land for Davis, to land with power, that means something. Santa Cruz digging to the body. Meanwhile, Davis looking for the angle for that uppercut. You don't always see Davis in that kind of defensive posture that he's in with his hands really high. While well, you're working with Floyd Mayweather, you better learn defense. <laughs> and there's Santa Cruz through the right. And Davis now loading up again with the left. Left uppercut, right hook by Davis. But 
Santa Cruz still looking to establish the jab, but he's getting hit. All right. Oh, those left hooks of Santa Cruz getting home. An eruption from the crowd here at the Alamo Dome. This main event delivering already here in round four. Lead right hook by Davis. Is this the right strategy for Santa Cruz? He's getting some good work done, but he's taking power punches. You know what this feels like? When Diego Corrales walked in, we thought he would box against Jose got, Luis Castillo. He stood in the pocket and battled. At first, we thought it was a bad idea. Turned out to be a good idea. What will happen tonight? If this fight turns into one-tenth yeah. the fight of Corrales Castillo won, this is going to be an all-time classic. Listen, I think Santa Cruz is doing the, the, a great job. I think he's doing the right thing. And most of these big Good fights, uh, a lot of these fighters, they say, no, you know, I'm going to let him uh, win the first uh, the first half of the fight. I'm going to box. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then uh, before you know it, you got half of the fight lost. So Santa Cruz doesn't doesn't want that. He wants to get in some rounds in and, and doing a fantastic job. Both in David and Santa Cruz, what a fight. Under a minute left in the fourth, Davis walking down Santa Cruz. Davis has gone to the body with the right hook. We've seen the left uppercut. Santa Cruz stealing a glance at his corner. The high guard. There's that long range jab from Santa Cruz. Well, you saw the jab and you saw oh. there, that counter uppercut is just poised for Davis. And he, even when he doesn't throw it, you can see he's ready to throw it. Double jab, then the left hand downstairs by Davis avoids those punches from Santa Cruz. And again, stabs Santa Cruz in the belly with the left. There's a jab to the midsection by Davis. Rounds are flying by here at the Alamo Dome. We are through four. Javante Davis getting that straight left hand in. That's one of his big power punches. And Santa Cruz trying to counter off that. The uppercut of Davis has been a, a very, very important weapon. The right hook getting in there. But then here, he comes with that uppercut on the inside. I'll tell you what, Santa Cruz is taking some big punches from Davis, and he's hanging in there right now. Now, he did have his good offensive moments. He would land the uppercut on the inside. This is the difference. Santa Cruz is a pure combination puncher. Abner, you know that better than anybody. Yes, he is, and he could be overwhelming. He, that could be overwhelming. That's why I said that Leo Santa Cruz should be the volume puncher in this fight to overwhelm a Tank Davis that's never seen that before. Santa Cruz has thrown 241 punches to 160 for Davis. That's not surprising. This is round number five. Davis leaning on his front foot. High guard, both of them. Double, triple jab by Santa Cruz as he tries to move forward. Davis moving to his left into the power alley of Santa Cruz. Leo has to keep touching him with that jab. Have Davis be thinking. Davis crouching down. He'll like to crouch down, shoot counters that his opponents rarely see coming. We've seen that on occasion tonight. And that left hand is just ready to be uncoiled. Ready to spring out. There's that lead right hook by Davis. One of the weapons that Santa Cruz has found in this fight, and he wants to get back to it, is his own left hook which is not normally his money punch, but he, he, he's kind of found a home for it. In the counter, left hand glances off the rib cage of Santa Cruz. And another counter left. Santa Cruz delivers a right. We talk about Santa Cruz combination punches. Difficulty putting them together here in the fifth as we move past the midpoint as that that left bomb is always ready to be returned. You know, Davis has landed some huge power punches here, so you got to give Santa Cruz credit already for being able to take that power. Doesn't mean he's going to continue to be able to. Known for his durability, his sturdy chin, and yeah, when you're taking shots from a guy like Davis, that's saying something. 
Remember, only one man has gone the distance in Davis's career. 23 and 0, 22 knockouts now. Santa Cruz trying to swarm Davis. Davis. Was there a clash of heads? You know, give Davis some credit for slipping a lot of these punches too. He's he, he's not getting hit a lot with those some of those combinations. But when Leo does that, he keeps Davis busy. When t when Leo stays in the back like that, he gives the, Davis the opportunity to land that one to uh, pick his punches. But when Santa Cruz is aggressive, despite him landing or not, one or two punches is going to land. You know, he keeps Davis you know on his back foot. Right. Final 15 seconds of the fifth. Much more tactical round. Yeah, I was going to say pace uh, baiting a bit. As both of them try to continue to collect data. As Davis again goes downstairs with a left uppercut, sweeping right hook upstairs. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's the one. That's the way you do it. Now you're going to get him in the lower body. But you got to throw the one, two, okay? And keep working the, the lower body. You're doing great. You're doing great. You got to hold him another two rounds, and then it's going to be your fight, Leo. He's going to get tired. Yeah. Nice and slow, nice and slow. Just fix that nose a little bit. Just hold them off, hold them off, and then the second part of this fight is ours. That's it, that's all he's going to have. That's all he has for this fight, that's it. You'll take it now. Round at number six. Davis, Santa Cruz's first left-handed opponent since March of 2014 when Santa Cruz successfully defended his 122 title against Christian Mijares. Oh, and there's a right downstairs by Santa Cruz that landed with a nice thud. And of course, we saw his dad in there, you know, taking a look and what must be going on in his mind. Nice right hand by Santa Cruz. Really good work from Santa Cruz. He's investing on the body, and that's something you yeah. want to do, especially in this sixth round uh, going into the fight. Uh, because as the game plan that he mentioned is to uh, pressure Tank Davis even more uh, after the half of the fight. You know, they are so convinced in that corner that after the sixth, seventh round, they're going to own Davis. They better hope that that's the case. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but they are, he is doing some fantastic work here, Santa Cruz. They both are chucking leather, and a mark now, a mouse beginning to form under the right eye of Gervonta Davis. So they are throwing punches and bunches here in the sixth. And that, that's courtesy of a couple of those left hooks that Santa Cruz has landed. Santa Cruz putting together his combinations. There's that lead left uppercut on the inside by Davis. What a great round so far for Santa Cruz, though. He has thrown his combinations have been precise in landing. And that was south of the equator. Davis has never been deducted any points for fouls. Went low with that one. Santa Cruz did not eat up much of the five minutes allotted for him to recover, and they continue here. Throwing punches, a minute 11 left in the sixth. I think if I was Santa Cruz, I would have taken more time to, to get Wait, myself no together. No punches, that's it. Leo not in Santa the Santa Cruz, Cruz yeah. DNA. Yeah, I was just going to say, Leo Santa Cruz do that now. <laughs> yeah, that would be ridiculous, huh? <laughs> There's a left hand by Davis under a minute left in the sixth. Davis now putting together power shots. Landed another thudding left hook. Santa Cruz standing there, taking it. And coming forward with punches of his own. Scintillating stuff here in the sixth round. Gervonta Davis, Leo Santa Cruz, two champions with the hearts of champions. If Davis thought Santa Cruz was going to fall from his...
Gervonta Tank Davis hits different. Leo Santa Cruz, of course, the concern is about him on the mat, and uh, they are tending to him. Leo Santa Cruz appears to be talking back, appears to be alert, but for the first time in his career, and this is a great sight to see. The fans applauding. Gervonta Tank Davis with a strong candidate for knockout of the year. And Leo even managing a smile. What do we say about that left uppercut? Well, he got lured into, uh, and he does get the manager's smile, you know. He got lured into a, a, a firefight with Davis, and the power of Davis is dramatic. And of course, by far, the, the biggest, best puncher Santa Cruz has ever faced in his life. And what's the definition of irony? That was probably Leo Santa Cruz's best round yeah. in the fight, and it ends with him being knocked out for the first time in his career. And you have to feel for the Santa Cruz family. Well, we talked uh, during the, most of this fight about that left uppercut, how it had landed, and it was always at the ready for Davis. And in that round in which Santa Cruz had done so much good work, there's that left uppercut. A counterpunch that just was devastating. And it was there the whole fight. Some big ones landed, but none like that. It's the punch that you don't see that does the most damage. And that punch came out of nowhere. Leo Santa Cruz did not see that uppercut coming. Um, it just and just took him out. But again, you gotta give credit to Leo Santa Cruz. He did something that I'm I was even, you know, shocked which was stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against a bigger puncher than Gervantes Davis. He was able to do that for a, a, a good portion of this fight, and they felt that if he'd gotten through these rounds, he was going to do well in the second half of the fight, but it was not to be. The power of Davis, too much for him. And the mentor, Floyd Money Mayweather, reacting to Gervonta Tank Davis's 23rd knockout in his 24th professional fight, all 24 wins. And Gervonta Tank Davis on Halloween night delivers the monster smash. The numbers, 55% uh, of the power punches landed by uh, Gervonta Davis, and many of them were potential knockout punches, but finally that uppercut did get the job done. Santa Cruz throwing more punches as we expected he might, and landing a fair number of them as well. But it was the power of Davis ultimately that got the job done, and many of those 80 power punches were in fact uh, some version of that left uppercut, but he landed the perfect one. Let's make it official. Here's Jimmy Lennon Jr. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the time. Two minutes, 40 seconds in round number six. He is the winner by way of knockout. He is still undefeated. And now, the WBA super featherweight and lightweight champion of the world, Gervonta Tank Davis. <laughs> Gervonta Tank Davis, hoping his power will power his unassailable ascent to mega stardom. That's how you close a show. That's how you close a night that featured four fights, four knockouts, none more memorable than the one we just witnessed. It was a... We'll take a look back at the keys to victory, and 
as we said at the beginning of this match with the keys the left hand would be the key for Davis he lands it in a variety of ways the uppercut tonight was the most important method but they're a kind of a straight left hand and throughout this fight the left was his calling card in terms of power and and you know Santa Cruz took some powerful left hands. Look at that one. There's an uppercut like the one that would end the fight. So it wasn't as if he didn't get hit with big ones before, but that was the one that closed the show. And uh, thankfully, Leo Santa Cruz uh, is okay and was able to get up from that. But uh, tremendous display of left-handed punching. Let's bring in our unofficial scores. Steve Farhood, what were your scores at the time of the uh, stoppage? Well, let's look at the unofficial scores, for, or the official scores first, my friend. Yeah, the uh, all three judges at Davis ahead, 48-47. Close fight. They gave Santa Cruz uh, the first and second rounds, but they gave Davis the third, fourth, and fifth, so Davis was taking control. You look at my card. I gave Santa Cruz only one round, the second round. I thought Davis's power was the difference from the beginning in a fight where obviously both fighters landed plenty of punches. Official scores again. Um, Glenn Feldman gave the first two rounds to Santa Cruz. David Sutherland gave the first two rounds to Santa Cruz, and then it was all Davis after that. So a fire hose blast of brutality. Let's go back to BC who's standing by with the star of the night, Gervonta Davis. Okay, Mo, thank you very much. Gervonta, congratulations on the victory. You told me you wanted a spectacular performance for your first pay-per-view fight. How would you assess your performance tonight? Um, I, I actually can't go uh, greater right now, but you know, once I once I go back and look over it, then I could be able to tell. It seemed like you were looking for the uppercut all night. It was it was a weapon that you used throughout that fight. Was that the key for you that you thought going into this fight? Um, it wasn't a key, you know, but I adapted to what what like what he was bringing. So I know he was a taller fighter, and he was he was crunching crunching up, so he was moving forward. So once he moved forward, I tried to slide from the jab and throw the uppercut to make a run into the shot. Did, did this fight go the way you thought it was going to go? You know, listen, I think from the Santa Cruz standpoint, they wanted to take you into deep water. Was it something that you wanted to end early? Yeah. So once once I, once I, once I, we started fighting. You know, you can see uh, at like the first round, I didn't really warm up in the back. So when I got out there, I was a little still cold. So I, I threw my jab, he threw it back, and then I threw it again, he threw it back. So I'm like, he trying to counter off of my count, I mean my punch. So I just adapted to what the, the, uh, what I uh, what I was into. I want you to take a look at this knockdown in the sixth round because you were throwing that uppercut and you caught him flush. Describe and talk to me about it. He was just right there for it. He he's a guy that you know he he, he punched, but he don't, he don't try to get out the way after his punching. I bit him right in. There's no way he could have went because the rope was right there. That's that's how a professional fighter uh, know that uh, they adapt to uh, the uh, the fight. What can you say about Leo Santa Cruz? Because there was at times he wanted to engage with you. What can you say about him and his toughness tonight? Um, he's a tough warrior, a, a, a strong Mexican. You know, he came to fight. He came. Uh, he came ready. It was just I was just a, a better person than uh, tonight. What can you say to all these fans here in San Antonio, over 9,000 who came out here to watch this? Uh, first, first, I want to say thank, thank you, uh, San Antonio. I wish I could. I, I hope I could come back in the future. Uh, second, you know, uh, people that bought pay-per-view all over, people that, that watched it, like uh, at all the events tonight. Um, second, I want to give a big uh, shout out to uh, Leo, Leo Dad. You know, through the hard times that he was going through, he was strong and he made it through his situation. So I want to uh, give a big shout out to uh, his dad, and he's the real champion tonight. You're now champion at 135 pounds. You're a champion at 130 pounds. Going forward, which one? Or do you see yourself campaigning at 135 or 130 going forward? I'll maintain that both, man. Uh, uh, whatever best decisions that my co my uh, team come up with and I come up with, we're going to go with it. But the best opportunity out there, I'm willing to fight whoever. I'm not ducking, dodging, nobody. As you know, there ain't no safety on this Glock. 
message do you think you sent to the boxing public here tonight? Because that was a great fighter you beat, and you knocked him out in the sixth round. What message do you think you sent to the boxing public about Gervonta Tank Davis? First, I want to say I'm a pay-per-view star. Second, I want to say that I'm not dug and dodging nobody. They know what's to, what it is. I'm number one. It showed the night, and I will continue to show the boxing world, the people that's all over the world, that I'm number one. Yeah. What will you not want next as we wrap this up? I mean, there's a lot of guys, Ryan Garcia. There's a lot of guys who've called you out. What is Tank Davis want next? Uh, I don't have to call nobody out right now. I'm, I'm the top dog. Everybody know that. So just line them up. I knock them down one by one. Congratulations, champion. Yes, sir. Let's go back ringside. All right, BC, damn right. Gervonta Davis likes the life he lives. He went from negative to positive and now walks out of the Alamo Dome with uh, two titles in two different weight classes. You talk about putting a crushing capstone on his pay-per-view debut. One of the most vicious left uppercuts you will see. And Floyd Money Mayweather celebrating his new pay-per-view star, Gervonta Tank Davis, closing the show as impressively as it gets, Abner Mades. Floyd Mayweather stopping by here to chat with us and, uh, and uh, have some moments. But Abner, as uh, Marl was asking you, a big moment for uh, Tank Davis. Yes, it's uh, rare to get Floyd Mayweather to uh, shake your hand and saying that you're doing a great job. And yes, listen, I think we just witnessed a, a pay-per-view pay -per -view star in the making, uh, Gervantes Tank Davis. Uh, what a great fight. I think both of these fighters uh, gave us a hell of a fight. Leo Santa Cruz for standing his ground, actually, for fighting the way he fought in Tank Davis, for, for showing that he could be in deep water and retaliate the way he did. All right, guys, uh, before we go any further, we captured some big audio dynamite in the corners during this fight. We call it trainer tracks. Defense first, go get the start here. You got this shit, you built for this shit. When you finish, get off the line here. Keep it simple, don't rush anything here. You can't fight them on the inside. We good, we excellent here. Now that round is like, uh, here. I need more defense out to go here. But you gotta throw the one two, okay? And keep working the, the lower body. You're doing great, you're doing great. You gotta hold them another two rounds and then it's gonna be your fight, Leo. He's gonna get tired. Shoot the uppercut to the ceiling, baby. <laughs> you put everybody on notice now. Pound for pound. Impressive work by Gervonta uh, Davis. There are big fights out there at 135 and 130 pounds. We want, as boxing fans, to see them made. And for more on tonight's fights and what else is ahead from Showtime, follow at Showtime Boxing on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the Show Sports YouTube channel for a wide range of post-fight coverage and original content. Well, it'll be a Halloween I'll never forget. Alamo Dome fans back for the first time during the pandemic and four fights, four knockouts. What a show, BC. Oh, absolutely, Mo. A fantastic night here from the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. Let's review the action from tonight. Four fights, all four knockouts. Isaac Cruz, Diego Magdaleno, IBF lightweight title eliminator. They call him mini Mike Tyson. This is why first round, look at the body shots to Diego. He drops him there in the first round and got right back on him. Watch this devastating uppercut. It was a night of uppercuts there, and that was it. A first round knockout for Isaac Cruz. 53 seconds in that first round, his 15th knockout of his career. Regis Progre, Juan Araldez, super lightweights, 10 rounds, and we go to the third round and watch Regis with that left hand right there. Jacks the draw of Araldez. Put him on the mat. Heraldes would get up. And the Rougarou got right back on him. And it was that right to the body that dropped him again. And that was it. The ref steps in, says no more 
a TKO, third round TKO for Regis Rougarou Probre. And then the WBA super lightweight champion Mario Barrios taking on the Cowboy Ryan Carl. You know, sixth round here. Watch that right hand over the top. That dropped the Cowboy. He would get up. Then they had a clash of heads that put a nasty cut on the forehead of Ryan Carl, and it really got worse for him here in the sixth round because Carl tried to fight back gallantly, but then it was this left hook there to Carl's body. That takes him down, and that was it. A six-round knockout for the unbeaten Mario Barrios. His first defense here in his hometown of San Antonio. And then the main event, Gervonta Davis, Leo Santa Cruz, the WBA lightweight super featherweight title on the line. We get right to the sixth round. He was looking for the knockout. He had it. Vicious uppercut. And Leo was knocked out. That was it. And the tank, they call him a tank for this power right here. Look at this. Devastating. Flush. Leo would get up and would be okay and got up on his own power after that knockout. But Javante Tank Davis, unbeaten, six-round knockout. He wins the WBA lightweight and super featherweight titles. That will do it for us from here at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. Now for Al Bernstein, Mauro Ranallo, Abner Morris, Steve Farhood, Felix De Jesus, and our entire Showtime sports crew. I'm Brian Custer. Good night from Texas.